Fantastic. Thank you. Welcome, everyone. Um, tonight is this is the Planning Zoning Commission of the Town of Darien. Tonight is um, Tuesday, February 9th. Um, Jeremy and I are in Town Hall in room 213, right? And this meeting is also being held virtually on GoToMeeting via the internet. Um, Tonight we have a public a public hearing and then a general meeting, time permitting, after the public hearing is completed. Um, we only have one application, which is, I think, a first-timer. Um, and then the general meeting, a couple of items. So without uh, further ado, we'll get right into it. Our first item on the agenda is business site plan application number 194H, as in Harry, special permit, applica uh, special permit <laughs> Felix F. Clary, Inc., Doing business as BMW of Darien, 136-140 Ledge Road. The proposal is to raise the vehicle service bays behind the existing sales building on the front lot, lot number 21E is in Edward, and replace them with service with a service intake building with substantial smaller foot with a substantial smaller footprint than the existing. Raise the smaller service building in the rear lot on lot number 20 on lot number 22 and construct a new larger service building with 30 service bays bmw's parts department and rooftop parking spaces construct a new uh, car wash vacuum building oh, along, the, Just along the north side of the front lot on a shared property line with whole foods market 150 ledge road Reconfigured the parking area throughout the site and perform related site development activities, including the installation of landscaping, lighting, and stormwater management. The 3.01 plus or minus acre subject property is located on the north side of Ledge Road, approximately 650 feet west of its intersection with Boston Post Road, and shown on its assessor's map number 39 as lot number 21E and number 22 in the SB Service Business Zone. Um, before we get started, just everybody knows, I drive a BMW. Um, I bought my BMW at Kalari or Darien of Auto. Um, I have a bunch of a couple other cars too, but if anybody wants me to recuse myself because I drive a BMW, um, please say so. With that said. I could keep... confess the same, but I'm not gonna do any advertising, so. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I can't be biased, man. Um, what else? We we actually we saw this property or this property about a year and a year and a half ago. We did a zoning adjustment or some zoning tweaks to the regulations. That was a public hearing and probably general meetings on that. That's right. That was a zone change last year, I believe. Yeah, it was it was in 2019. I think we got it acted in 2020. Yeah. Okay. Um, so we that was a precursor or a preamble. Of this that I guess what we did back then may have facilitated what. The application is tonight. I think tonight we have Wilder Gleason representing the ownership. I see you, Wilder. There he is. There he is. Hey, Wilder. Um, so, without further ado, Wilder, the floor is yours, sir. Take it away. Thank you very much, and I really appreciate the commission having a special meeting so we can present in one night. We have a long lineup of people to present. Uh, I will open. Uh, I'm opening just as an introduction. I will then introduce Paula, uh, Paula Kalari, the owner and president of uh, the BMW uh, Kalari Auto Group, will speak next. I will then pick up after her to describe basically what we're doing and give you an overview. Um, <clears throat> then I will have Craig Flaherty, our engineer and site planner, uh, speak about the drainage and uh, the design elements and why we wound up where we did as a site plan. We will then have Mike Kozlowski, our architect, uh, describe the buildings and the changes that we're doing and review those floor plans and elevations with you. Then Katie Haas, our landscape architect, will take you through the landscaping. We have a substantial landscaping plan that's proposed um, and also the lighting. We are going to introduce all new lighting in. Uh, significant changes to the lighting, particularly in the back in the service area, uh, the area that is currently visible to our residential neighbors. And then John Canning, our traffic expert, will speak and summarize his report 
which you have a copy of, and then Martin Schiff, our acoustician or noise expert, will be speaking about the noise and how this project actually improves noise. And I am really pleased that um, you guys took, uh, uh, made the change that you did uh, over a year ago, basically, um, to allow us to develop this plan, which is very consistent with the drawings that we submitted back in 2019, uh, showing rooftop parking, showing a large service building, and uh, the thing that I'm most struck with is that despite, uh, I mean, we have met numerous times with the neighbors. Uh, Paula Calari has given our team full reign to meet as many times as necessary with the neighbors. We have tried to reach out and develop uh, and understand their concerns and respond to those concerns. And this team feels very confident that we have met the spirit and intent of the regulations and the letter of the regulations, and that the hardest thing you need to do, which is to make a finding that the, um, the rooftop parking will have no adverse impact on adjoining property, that you are going to be very comfortable making that finding when we're done, because we make things better for the condos. We reduce traffic. We reduce noise. We eliminate current lighting impacts. And we're moving noise from a car wash and vacuum line over 100 feet further away. These are all benefits to the neighbors. Unfortunately, we have been unable to convince them that that is the case. And so we are here before you tonight. And I would like Paula to address you first um, to sort of set up a little bit about uh, the Kalari Auto Group and who they are and what they've meant in town. Thank you, Wadler. Hi, good evening, everybody. Uh, I'm Paula Kalari, representing the Kalari family. We're the owners of BMW Darien and many of Fairfield County. Uh, I'm pleased to also have on the Zoom uh, my mother, Sylvia, my sister, Flavia, here with my daughter, Sam. I have my daughter, Cassie, here, and my nephew, George, who also works at the dealership. Uh, we're all very vested in this business and the growth of the business that needs to happen. Um, this family-owned business has been in Darien for over 35 years on this commercially zoned property located at 136 and 140 Ledge Road. Just in case some of you don't know, we're right next to exit 11, I-95, Whole Foods. We abut the town dump and a small section is uh, we neighbor the Middlesex Commons. And our mini location is at 154 Post Road. I've been president of BMW uh, since 2008, when my father and founder, Felix Kalari, passed away. Over 35 years ago, my father chose the location of 136, 140 Ledge Road as the home of our BMW franchise due to its easy access for our customers on and off I-95, its proximity to the Darien downtown, and being a commercially zoned parcel with room for growth. Every 10 years or so, the automotive manufacturers require certain upgrades to dealership facilities in order to stay in tune with the needs of our customers and current technology. The objective being a positive customer experience. Our last major change was approved in 2007 where we added nine service bays to the back shop, added a car wash to the rear annex building and redesigned the showroom. BMW Corporate is very demanding with their dealership requirements and deadlines for changes to be completed. Our design team has been working on this project for two years to determine which would be the most efficient and best design to achieve BMW Corporate requirements. Many of our competitors already provide drive-in service. Being able to pull into a facility, speak to your service advisor, get into a loaner car in a timely and efficient manner. It's a must for the customers. Their time is extremely important. Quick in and out is key. And when there is inclement weather, this is imperative that customers are able to drive into a service area. Examples of some of these newly renovated dealerships are Land Rover, Jaguar, and Darien, Toyota of Stanford, as well as our competitors, BMW of Greenwich and BMW of Ridgewood. Although we are checking off the boxes for the BMW requirements, we're also very cognizant of the town requirements and our neighbors' concerns. 
We have always had a good relationship with Middlesex Common community, and for this project, we have had numerous meetings with them. I feel that we have gone above and beyond to address their concerns and minimize impact to the neighboring condominiums. Examples being, which uh, Wilde already mentioned, changing rear lights, designing a roof parapet instead of the original rooftop fence, larger trees, more trees, and adding trees onto their property. Among other things, the result being less noise they will hear from us, less noise from I-95, less noise from the dump. And at night, there'll be uh, less light seen, if any at all, and better landscaping for the neighbors. I'm confident that once you hear our presentation, you'll conclude that our application warrants approval and that the requirements of your regulations have been satisfied. I wanna thank my team for working diligently on this project, and I wanna thank the board for volunteering their time. I know this is a thankful, thankless job. Um, I'll now turn it over to Wilder. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you Paula. Appreciate um, that. Thank you, Paula. Um, uh, Fred, can uh, Craig have control of the screen so he can uh, present our project? Okay, Felix F. Kalari Inc. is the owner and operator of BMW of Darien. Next slide, please, Fred. I have Frank. <laughs> Craig. And this is the view of the condos, and this is where our service building will go. And this is the crucial issue for you is the impact that our rooftop parking and service building structure are likely to have upon these condos. And it also includes not only the condos here, which are on the western end of the condominium complex, but also the condos behind the service building that you see here. And um, we believe that our design, based on the expert's testimony that we're going to submit tonight, including noise, including traffic, and the landscaping plans and the lighting plans that we're proposing will make a significant improvement and reduction of the impact that this current facility has upon the neighbors. So, um, Craig, let's go to the next slide, please. So, BMW um, is located, as Paula said, right next to I-95 on Ledge Road, <clears throat> adjacent to the town Department of Public Works, next to the Recycling Refuse Center, otherwise known as the town dump, adjacent to the Middlesex Condominiums Complex, which is in a commercial zone, be advised. It's there because it's a residential overlay zone that was adopted many years ago, but it is still zoned commercially. And it's next to Whole Foods, which um, abuts most of the condominium property. We are very close to the central business district with the sports shop less than a thousand feet away. And that's the end of the central business district. <clears throat> um, we have been in business since the mid 1980s, providing BMW sales and service at this site. We sell new and pre owned BMWs on the site, all of the new car deliveries occur at our Crescent Street site in Stamford. So we don't have trailer trucks coming to this site. Um, and that's one of the reasons we're asking for a waiver of the loading zone. We haven't had a formal loading zone for a long time. We don't need it because our deliveries of any trailer truck deliveries occur elsewhere. Our existing site plan, let's switch to the next slide, please. Craig, thank you. <clears throat> um, we have a total of 29 service bays now, 23 behind our main sales building. And when you look at it, there's 16 garage doors that face the condominium. See those? Every time a car goes in, the garage door goes up. The lights from inside that get uh, shown out. The noise from inside goes to, is, you know, can be directed at the condos. We have 10 service, we have 10 service bays uh, or uh, garage doors in this smaller service area, which includes six service bays, a vacuum line to clean 
uh, service vehicles and loaner cars, and a car wash line. Both of those lines have very loud equipment. And they are less, they're about 90 feet from the condominium property. Um, there are 73 parking spaces in the rear lot, which means a fair amount of activity, but most of the activity is related to the car wash and the vacuum lines because each car goes through, each of the loaner vehicles and the service vehicles go through those lines every day. And that generates a lot of activity on the site. We also lease a portion of property from the town that is over uh, on our side of Cummings Brook and really not usable by the town. And we have 20, 34 parking spaces there with a long-term lease with the town. And Whole Foods leases 30 spaces to us in the rear of their parking lot adjacent to our property. 30 spaces there. So there's a total of 64 spaces that we have leased now for probably 10 years um, to accommodate our dealership and what's happening here. So what we're proposing is actually to tear down the service building in the back and replace that with a much larger, uh, a larger structure that houses 30 bays. And then once that's constructed, we're going to move through and eliminate the service area behind our showroom and office space. So to the left of that red line is all going away and we're then gonna construct a new serv uh, service intake building. And uh, let's go to the next slide if we can. Um, so what will happen, and these are the program changes that frankly have taken years to work out with BMW and have the design work and everything else. First of all, pre-owned BMW sales that are on our site will move to the Mini at exit 13. That will reduce the number of sales staff that we have on site. The Mini service will come from exit 13 down to our site. And with our new service building, we'll be able to accommodate it on site. We don't anticipate any significant increase in service because the cars are much better now than they were. They use less service. They're technological marvels. You can reprogram them over the internet. Um, and that is what's happening. So the need to actually come in and get service is reduced. I remember when I had to change my oil every 3,000 miles, and now it's 7,500 miles. And similar changes have occurred throughout the um, engineering of the automobiles. So we will raise the rear service building as we discussed. We'll construct a new service building with 30 service bays. We have 29 service bays now. We will increase the service bays by one, there will be a parts department in the new service building on two floors, on the south side, away from the condominiums. So the storage for parts is above, and the intake and delivery of parts will be on the first floor. We will have 35 rooftop parking spaces. When we first designed, as uh, so admitted, we said 37 spaces on site. But in an effort to accommodate and address concerns of the ARB and the neighbors, we have changed the design of the parapet wall around the rooftop parking to a mansard roof, and we lost two spaces in doing that. We're happy to do it. The spaces will be uh, uh, screened by a mansard roof, similar to what uh, Walgreens in the Heights has, and similar to what you see at um, Maplewood, where it looks like there's a, a, a pitched roof, but there's really not one. It's also similar to the buildings, that, um, uh, the Stanford Health Center building on the Post Road, leading uh, towards Stanford out of, of the center of town, just beyond Nielsen's and um, the Chevrolet dealership. Um, so we will raise the 23 service bays in the rear of the sales building, but keep the sales and office space in front as we highlighted um, in the screenshot. Next, we'll construct a new service intake building addition 
with three drive-through intake lanes and waiting rooms for BMW and many customers. We will relocate and replace site lighting, particularly in the service area, the area behind the gate where customers can't go. And that will be based on all new LED lights that are dimmable. They automatically go down to, I think, 50% of their normal intensity, and that each of the lights will have a motion sensor so that they will stay down unless there is a security concern or potential security concern. We have a very robust and extensive landscaping plan concentrating on screening the condominiums and including by agreement with the condominium board, eight 20 foot to 22 foot arbor value on the condo property. Um, they would like us to plant those. What we will do is we will pay to have their landscaper install them. Um, we will also upgrade our drainage system to bring it into compliance with the current regulations. We will store, we'll restore a wetland and detention basin in the front. So that's the program changes. Let's go to the next slide. So here's what the building looks like. We have, um, you can see as you enter, the driveway isn't changing at all. We still have a fire lane. You come back and there's an addition behind the sales building, which is the three service intake bays. And there will be a mini waiting room on the rear corner right there. And the BMW waiting room for BMW customers will be there. And the service uh, aisles will be diagonally through the center of this. And the cars can then come out and be taken to the service building or parked in here for delivery to service when appropriate. We will install first the new service building, which has 30 service bays in it. And the garage doors, none of them face the condominiums on the north. There is a single garage door on the east facing Whole Foods and a single garage door on the west and six garage doors on the south where we have lower service bays that are more for technical stuff. You don't need big lifts for this type of service. And then the parts department is in the front on the first floor with storage above. Above that will be 35 parking spaces covered, surrounded by a mansard roof at an elevation of 78 feet. That's the base elevation. And that's important, you'll see in the various reports, but I want you to remember that number, please. Please note that the condominium property on the north side is about eight to 10 feet taller or higher than our property. The Whole Foods Market property is six to eight feet taller than ours. And along the front, as we enter the parking lot, um, coming in the site, on the right side, the Whole Foods property rises, so it's about six feet or eight feet above us in the middle, right where that is, and then at the far end where the new car wash is gonna be located, it's four to six feet above where that car wash is. So the car wash will be nestled in against the, 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 um, the depth of the Whole Foods property and partly screened by it. Um, let me keep going. Um, um, these changes will result in a, a reduction in our employee count of 86 to 76. Um, based on our expert reports, the changes will actually reduce the impact of noise, traffic, and parking on the neighboring condos while confining all of our service line activities to the inside of a building that provides sound deadening and protection. Um, it will be an efficient operation because parts now will be right situated where the service departments are instead of having to be conveyed from where uh, to a, a remote service uh, area as it was in the original design. The current design 
requires our parts to be delivered out to those service bays. The car wash and vacuum lines will be located about 100, and 100 feet further from the condominiums. So they're going to be more than twice as far away from the property line than exists now, and they will be screened by the grading on the Whole Foods property. The condominium view of the service lot in the back will improve because instead of looking at an active traffic lot with 73 parking spaces on it, there will be a residential character building with a mansard roof and occasionally a car is coming by and it will be screened by really robust landscaping. Um, at this point, let's see, we received EPC approval in November for the work that we're doing. We have been to ARB four times now and because we had a short meeting tonight, we are going back for a fifth time, which is unprecedented in my experience, but we anticipate receiving a favorable report from them um, in light of the changes we've made to address their concerns and the neighbors' concerns. Um, the parking and traffic study confirms substantial reduction in the number of trips on the service lot. Currently, we have 692 trips a day. Most of those a result of the vacuum line and the car wash. That will drop from, call it 700 trips, 692 slips, trips to less than 300. Uh, John Canning will recite that for you and uh, tell you how that um, works. And then our acoustic report expert, Martin Schiff, did an elaborate study, checked everything going on, looked at the um, changes we're making, and then had to reevaluate it because we changed from a, a uh, what was going to be a structural wall around the rooftop parking. We changed to a mansard roof and he redid his study. We submitted the revised study just this week or earlier, um, just this week, I believe. And his conclusion remains the same that the noise impacts from our current activities will be reduced as a result of this application. So there's very substantial benefits that this application proposes to us and to the neighbors. Craig, if we could have the next slide, please. First, for us, we're what, going Marla, to- Can I ask you one quick um, overview question? Sure. Where's the ramp going up to the to the rooftop parking? Is it on the left side or the right side? It's on the right side. Craig's highlighting it. It's a 12 foot ramp one way that's on the it, between the Whole Foods parking lot and our service building. It goes up. And then at the top, the ramp allows us to enter and come down. And there will be a safety system so we don't have car crashes on the ramp. So it's 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 two ways, but it's a single lane. Single lane, 12 feet wide. And yep. on the north side of that, there's a four foot wall that when we get to the top becomes uh, a eight foot fence, permanent uh, structural fence right here. And that is important for the sound study. It reduces visual impact and reduces sound uh, impact to the neighbors. The driveway, the driveway on the other side of the building where the red marker is now, what's that? That's the exit from the, um, the main service bay. We have 24 service bays that with a central aisle. And there's a door on the east side near Whole Foods, a garage door. It's a quick, uh, oh, Craig's going to, I think Craig's got it. Craig, you're going to go to a different side? Yeah, okay. Okay, so um, this is not oriented the same way, but uh, the, the, the east up. side is now on the left. So we enter here and the ramp is to the south underneath us. So here's the ramp coming up to the, uh, the, the rooftop parking. So yep. on the first floor, we enter here. There's a single aisle with 24 bays and we exit 
on the dump side or the transfer station side, and that's a single garage door, and then we come back out. So the activity is further from the condos, there's less activity, and whatever activity is confined within a, a building uh, that's totally enclosed. And you can see in, the, in this, the parts department in the front where that's located. And then the, there's six service bays, a uh, one, two, three, four, five, six right there. Those first six are lower and those are for like reprogramming the cars and doing things that don't require a full size lift. Understood. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Sorry about so, that. Um, the bottom line, we believe we will provide serious benefits to the condos by reducing the impacts. But first for us, we are going to meet customer expectations for expedited service intake, loaner exchange, and doing all this in a conditioned environment inside. We will have a very efficient service building integrated with the parts department. All of the services inside with fewer garage doors all facing away from the condos. We will reduce our employee count from 86 to 76. We'll reduce traffic impact in the rear lot. We will reduce noise from the car and vacuum lines by moving them further away and consolidating them into a single building that does both, which reduces trips. <clears throat> we will eliminate current lighting impacts. Katie will review the current exist uh, the existing conditions and show you that our lights are not uh, can use some improvements and we are doing that. It'll minimize future impact and we'll upgrade our drainage system to restore the wetland. So those are the benefits we see. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Craig to elaborate about the drainage and to talk about why we designed this the way that we did. Uh, thank you, Wilder. Um, uh, my name is Craig Flaherty, professional engineer licensed in the state of Connecticut, principal and senior engineer with Redness and Mead, a land use consulting company with offices in Stanford and Wilton, providing land surveying, site civil engineering, and land use consulting services for this applicant. Um, Wilder did a great job orienting you to the site. Uh, I'll point out a few uh, more things as we go. Uh, from the drainage perspective, uh, there's an existing detention basin here in the front side of the site, uh, which was constructed when the dealership was constructed to manage stormwater. Um, uh, that had developed into kind of a man-made wetland uh, over time. Uh, uh, and for that activity that we were doing in that detention basin and the activity that we were doing in this back corner, closer to the Cummings Brook, uh, we visited the Environmental Protection Commission uh, and received uh, their uh, approval on our application uh, back in December. Um, the, uh, there's also a, a, the way a fire apparatus access the site, the Darien ladder truck, the largest uh, vehicle that um, the uh, uh, fire departments have, can come in the site, down this fire aisle, um, and get to the back site this way, then there is an ability also to use an emergency gate, which is right here at the back of the Whole Foods parking lot, uh, which the fire department has keys to, um, to then return out of the site this way if this is blocked or come into the site uh, this way if this is blocked. So not only is it a, a redundant means of ingress and egress for the fire department, but it also makes it easy for them not to have to do a K turn to turn around and get back out of the site with some of their larger equipment. Um, as we started to develop the site, there's, uh, there's some numbers, right, that start to sound familiar. Um, 237 existing parking spaces, uh, 235 proposed parking spaces, 29 existing service bays, 30 proposed service bays. Um, so although uh, we are going from 20% building coverage to 25% building coverage, which was allowed by the text amendment we got a year ago, um, a lot of that space isn't for more stuff. It's not for more activity and more service and, and, and uh, more stuff. It really is to provide um, covered areas largely for that customer intake area. Um, and that drive aisle you saw 
in the rear building. But how do we uh, maintain uh, this uh, uh, successful business? Sorry, was there a question? Yeah, can you just repeat that again? Because I think that was important. I, I think I missed it. With the covered yeah. aisle that you talked about, just repeat that for that point to me again about the covered sure. area, how it changes, and where the increase is being used primarily. Sure. So uh, we go from a 20% building coverage to a 25% building coverage. And uh, our architect, Mike Kozlowski, will go through this when he shows you the floor plans. But um, Basically, the customer intake area is three aisles for cars to enter the building so that customers can drop off and pick up their cars or drop off their loaner and pick up their car um, in a, a covered interior conditioned space. That right now happens on site um, in this drive aisle and in these parking spaces, which is not efficient and can gum up the drive aisle. It's all by appointment, so it's managed so there's not a lot of stacking. Um, but that's one way. We're taking an activity that currently occurs outside and we're bringing it inside. The other uh, reality, as we pointed out, all these garage bays currently just open right onto a drive aisle on site. So you have a garage bay going right out to a drive aisle on site, a garage bay going right out to a drive aisle on site, you know, 20. Um, different doors opening and closing throughout the day. Uh, very difficult to keep those spaces conditioned. You can imagine cold weather with that door opening and closing or hot weather with that door opening and closing. Um, now we're going into a situation where we have 24 bays accessed by two garage doors, but that means we have this 24 foot wide drive aisle basically, um, which today is outside, right? but tomorrow is super efficiently between a double loaded bay of stacked um, service equipment inside. So the reality is if you add up that space that effectively happens outside today, that's where the increase in building coverage is coming from, right? We still have from 29 to 30 service bays. We're going from 235 cars to 200, or 237 cars, to 235 cars. So this is not about more stuff. This is about, again, improving customer experience, making it more efficient, making it easier for the customer, uh, and certainly making it easier for the business. Did that answer your question? That was really, really, really helpful. But you talked so much about how the fire engines can, is there still a corridor for them to get? Yes. Yeah, we, we, we've we met, uh, we met with uh, Mark McEwen and, and Bob Bush and uh, recently had a follow-up call with Bob Bush. Um, okay. We're going to be able to address his comments, but we did this a year ago to make sure this plan would okay. meet his approval, um, and, and so we we did it early on. But yeah, that ladder truck can still make this turn, and we have turning radiuses that I can show you if you want to get that technical. The new proposed service building looks really tight. Yeah, it's actually it's it's a fairly big site. So yeah, um, let me zoom in a little bit. So these are actually 25 foot wide drive aisles all the way around it. Oh, wow. so that's, okay. that's, 20, that's 25 feet. It might look like it's narrower just kind of visually, yeah. yep. but they're 25 feet wide. And that enables the fire apparatus to be able to get um, to at least three sides of the building. Um, Zooming in. Yeah. Uh, so the large ladder truck can get in here uh, and can do the turnaround just as it did before. For the fire marshal, we're adding a fire hydrant at the back of the site, which requires us to uh, extend a water main so he gets a fire hydrant back there. Uh, okay. Both buildings will be fully sprinklered. Um, there'll be a standpipe that uh, uh, they can access that goes vertically up this building. Um, and the ramp actually uh, makes it very easy for firefighters to walk up to uh, the roof at any time, right? They don't need to ladder up to the roof necessarily, depending on the specifics of the fight, although they tend to use the ladder for spraying water, um, not necessarily access. Um, so anyway, we, we met with Bob. Uh, we saw his initial comments from his memo of, uh, earlier, you know, a few days ago. We, we followed up on a phone call. We believe he's gonna be satisfied. Um, and I think Wilder actually sent him a letter uh, response today uh, addressing all of his points. Um, so, uh, a few other things to point out. Um, 
along here, there's a 20 foot rear yard setback. Um, there's this, although there's a six foot or uh, four foot, four foot side yard in the SB zone. Um, that little nuance in your regs that say when a side yard um, angles by more than 60 degrees at any one point, uh, it thence becomes a rear yard. So that creates this 20 uh, foot rear yard setback. So as soon as we remove this service building, uh, we can't put it back where it is today. We have to obey that 20 foot rear yard setback, which starts to limit the room available to us in this front lot. We also have to keep this business operating um, while the new facilities are effectively constructed around it. So to build those three uh, uh, service buildings, um, I believe we're gonna build the car wash first up front here so that we can knock uh, the service building with the car wash in it down. Um, and then once that service building, the one in the back is removed, we can build a new service building on the rear, rear lot while the business is continuing to operate on the front lot. So that's a critical component. And that's why really the service building ended up back there. Um, and it's also generally the size of the service building really only fits in this geometry. It does not fit in this geometry, even if we could figure out a way to build it there while everything else was in the way. So uh, there are zoning setbacks on the rear lot as well. A 25 uh, 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 foot setback here, 20 foot setback there, 25 foot setback there, 20 foot setback here. So you can see um, there's no room to push it forward, for instance, uh, further away from the condos. We actually didn't, uh, this is really in effect just a retaining wall, which is technically allowed in a yard uh, per your regulations, uh, but we didn't want to push it any closer to the condos. And if you focus on this area, um, and, and Katie will go into this a little bit more, but if you focus on this area around where the new service building is going to be, and you focus on the green on our site, I'll just flip back and forth a couple of times between the existing plan and the proposed plan. You can see where we're adding green space, which enables us to add more landscaping adjacent to the neighbors. So here is the existing, here is the proposed. Back to existing, proposed, right? So we're adding green space in this area to enable us to do more um, planting. Um, as we described, there'll be a light system uh, that uh, uh, defines when people can safely go up the ramp and down the ramp. Um, but to be very specific, again, there's a four foot concrete wall above the level of the ramp all along this, um, all along this edge. And that four foot height was chosen uh, for sound deadening and also headlight uh, screening. Um, and then, of course, Katie's planting is back here as well. But there's a four foot parafoot wall, four feet higher than the ramp through here. This is where that 10 foot tall mansard roof is. So from the level of the parking deck, this roof goes up 10 feet. Um, there's a gap in that roof. So to prevent either noise to get out or visual impact coming in, this portion of the wall that goes around the uh, entrance area is also 10 feet tall. Um, and that's to completely screen this from view and make it invisible, which it will be, uh, in terms of being able to actually see the cars from uh, uh, Middlesex Commons. Wait, they can't uh, see the cars on the rooftop? They will not be able to see the cars on the rooftop, period. Wait, the rooftop is not taller than 10 feet? The, no, no, the, 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 the surrounding, and you'll see this uh, more specifically in Mike's details, this wall is 10 feet higher than the roof. So- Which wall? I'm sorry, I'm, I'm still yeah, not sure. gonna- <laughs> Sure, sure. Uh, hold on, let me zoom in a little bit more. Hard, so I'm good at like visual, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. This wall, and we, we have, later in the presentation, we have renderings, um, okay. so simulations of exactly what it's gonna look like. So if you're not visualizing it well now, hold tight. Michael goes okay. through it very specifically. <laughs> but imagine it was a, this was a surface lot. Um, and there was a 10 foot fully opaque wall around the parking lot. Okay. That's what we're doing. So you can't see 
through that wall from anywhere around the parking lot. But how tall is this going to be? So again, we've got sections, we've got aerials, we've got bird's eyes. There's plenty of stuff to, to orient yeah. you uh, uh, as, as we get through the whole presentation. If you still have questions, we'll, we'll go at it again. It's going to be taller than 10 feet, right? I know yeah, you're saying so, that. Yeah, this is the, 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 the floor. So the, the, the car is here. Fancy over it, but like if they're in a condo that makes them higher than 10 feet, they probably can. We've looked at those sight lines and we have cross sections from the condos, from their windows, from where their eyes would be. Not into their apartments, into their condos? Yes, we actually were uh, admitted access to one of the condos oh, wow. and took pictures from a second oh, wow. story okay. deck. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. <laughs> um, okay. To, yeah. to come up with our plan. That's oh, correct. Okay. Okay, cool. And okay. we walked the site a couple of times with them also and seen the position of their condos and the views that they're concerned about. Oh, okay, cool. All right. Yep. It's in the, it, those pictures are in the packet, Kara. Look no, in, I know. It's yeah. Just, yeah. I'm not visual. I'm like I know. a word blur. I'm a reader. I, I don't want to take take uh, Mike's thunder. Yeah. But this is the the view, right? This is the back side. This is the ramp on the left. Yeah. Right. This is that mansard roof we keep talking about. That's yeah. ten feet higher than the cars. The cars are behind this. Anyway, I'm gonna go back to the site plan, and then we'll and, and I'll let Mike do his job <laughs> in a little bit. Um, I'm, I'm kind of describing why we ended up uh, in the order we ended up and why uh, the service building had to come back here uh, and why it makes sense back here. Um, beyond uh, that, uh, so we also handled drainage. We submitted a uh, full drainage report and drainage plans. Uh, your uh, planning and zoning hired uh, Joe Canis of Tie and Bond to uh, provide the peer review on our drainage report. Um, uh, he did a very thorough job with his uh, review. Um, generally thought it was uh, uh, looking good and headed in the right direction, but there were a lot of technical details he wanted clarified. Uh, we should get a package out to him uh, tomorrow with our response on all of those technical details. But um, big picture, any redevelopment like this uh, is an opportunity to improve uh, drainage conditions uh, by way of your uh, Section 880 um, uh, stormwater management regulations, because when we're doing knockdown rebuilds, we have to pretend the starting site was nothing but open meadow, right? And so we have to uh, mitigate as if our existing condition was open meadow, and we do that. Um, we do it by modifying the detention basin in the front to hold a little bit more water a little longer. Uh, we do that by adding three subsurface infiltration systems in the back um, to uh, 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 not only handle water quality through catch basin sumps and hoods, oil grit separators, and then the infiltration system. So we have this treatment train uh, that a drop of water has to go through to get off the site um, and into Cummings Brook. Um, the, the, basically two different watersheds that go in different directions. Uh, Ledge Road is collected by uh, storm sewers and ledge road that go under I-95 uh, that end up going all the way down the post road, uh, uh, basically outletting into the Stony Brook near Town Hall. Um, and then Cummings Brook is a tributary of Stony Brook. Cummings Brook is the brook uh, in the recycling center and transfer station, uh, which heads over to Stony Brook Park and then goes under I-95 that way. Everything, all drainage heads south away from the condos. This is not one of the concerns uh, the condos has. Uh, we've got wetlands approval because of these water quality improvements, um, and uh, we look forward to Joe's further review of our response, um, which again, he should have shortly. Um, we did check the box for grading uh, earth uh, excavating and filling. Um, although we're largely maintaining uh, the levels of the site, there's one area where we're doing some filling closer to the property boundary, and really that is along this northern property boundary near the neighbors. Um, and the reason we're filling back here on this uh, uh, north side of the ramp is to elevate the ground level, one, to just literally hide some of that ramp elevation with dirt, um, but also to give us um, some elevated height 
to the landscaping that we're planting here. It's like building a berm so that you could plant on top of the berm. So we're doing some grading in here, and that's why we had to check the box for grading and filling. Um, uh, but uh, of course, we meet the uh, requirements of Section 850 on uh, on stability and, and sediment erosion controls and uh, lack of impact because of that uh, grading. But important to mention because we checked that box uh, as a part of the special permit application. Um, I think those are the high, highlights of the um, uh, site design. And uh, up next, we'll give you Mike, and he can go through uh, some of the uh, details of the architecture, um, see if you have any further questions there. Craig, before you go away, can I ask you one quick question, I think? Of course, sir. The water from the car wash going in and out, can you just touch on that real quick? Is yeah, so... The car wash is there today, but yes. I think it was an afterthought. Now it's a brand new building. Yeah, there is. Uh, there are uh, uh, car wash specific uh, oil grit separators in the ground uh, for existing conditions. So all of the water uh, generated within the building um, ends up going to that system, and we will have a similar system uh, that's. Um, it's regulated uh, by a general permit from the DEP, the types of oil grit separators you need to have for a car wash system before that uh, discharges into the sanitary sewer. So it doesn't get recycled or any of that stuff, it just, it goes. It well, goes it, it, there may be a component of recycling depending on the specifics of the car wash, but ultimately uh, any any effluent or discharge um, goes through the oil grit separator and, 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 and leaves the site that way. Okay. And just for everyone knows, just for the record, the site plan that, that Craig has up on the screen is dated, I think, December 11th. The new site plan is dated yeah. February 2nd. So that car wash got moved. Oh, well, yeah. Let me, uh, let me put the right one up there. I don't know how the old That's one. Right. Yeah, okay. I yeah, just don't want anyone to keep the price. Thank you, Steve. Car wash is over here now. <laughs> good good <Yeah>. catch. <laughs> and it, the same thing with the package. Exhibit A and the could change or exhibit B in the packet change. Okay, there you go. Is exhibit B yeah. where is the car wash is or no? This is where the car wash is going to be. We okay. moved it. Uh, we moved it west because the ARB wanted uh, a little more separation from a utility building from the front. Okay. Um, the good thing about moving it west is that one of the uh, open doors from the car wash and vacuum is now. Uh, effectively behind the service building as compared to the condos. So the yeah. noise from this end um, yeah. is largely screened by this building. Uh, and this one is tilted a little south, a little bit away. So that had a positive net impact on noise levels. That's why we got a new sound study dated February 4th versus the first one dated February 28th. It's one of the reasons that and the mansard roof change and the reduction of two parking spaces and that, those sorts of things. Anyway, so uh, any more questions on site before we go to architecture? Good here. Any other commissioners or any questions? Jim, uh, Larry, or Jen? No, George, you're good. Thanks, Craig. All right, Mike, you're up. All right, Craig, thank you. Uh, Mike Kozlowski with uh, Claire's Design Build. Uh, we're the architects on the project. Um, right now, Craig Hub has up on the screen a couple of the bird's eye views we did of our uh, architectural 3D modeling uh, of the site. Uh, you can see in the top left, uh, just to orient yourself, it's a little different than the site plan. Uh, we're looking down at the top left of the showroom building that will have the new service drop-off location. In the middle of the three buildings, there's the car wash uh, that was just talked about. And at the bottom right of the building, of, of, the, of the bird's eye, uh, shows the uh, rooftop parking with cars on it, uh, solar panels, and the mansard roof. Um, the other two renderings here just kind of show the same thing, just from different angles. Um, each one of these buildings will be highlighted shortly uh, with their own drawings and renderings. Um, we can go to the next slide. Uh, this is architecturally the floor plans. Um, as discussed previously, uh, if you zoom in right there at the top floor plan, Craig, uh, right along uh, column line A1, which is pretty much right in the center of the building right there, uh, everything to the left is existing structure to remain. There will be some modifications on the inside uh, with walls um, and, and some other elements that BMW corporate is requiring. 
uh, to the right of that column line where the new service edition, the service drop-off edition, you can see the three diagonal lanes uh, for the first two being for BMW, the third lane being designated for any mini service uh, drop-off. Uh, lanes are diagonal because, uh, of, as Craig mentioned before, we have a setback issue and we needed to be able to get three cars deep. Um, and if we were to go perpendicular up and down on the page, uh, we would not be able to get the requirements uh, from BMW corporate and to create a, an open and a, a more uh, inclusive environment for more customers that be dropping off their vehicles at one time. Um, again, a part of the interior renovations include new customer lounges for both Mini and BMW uh, uh, customers. The second floor, uh, there would be some small modifications on the left side um, as there was on the lower level. And then on the upper uh, right level would be second floor um, storage space now, but potentially future office space. Uh, next slide. Uh, here at the top here, you can see the existing uh, elevation of the front that would be seen from Ledge Road. Um, it's existing uh, aluminum storefront with uh, glass, AC, white ACM panels, um, and uh, similar to what is there now. Um, there's really not much change. Uh, the aesthetic of the building is going to stay the same from, from the very front of Ledge Road from this perspective. The real change comes down um, again to the right of the blue line that you see there, which is similar, the same column line that was just spoken about during the floor plan. Uh, this, the BMW uh, drop off lanes will match the existing facility uh, in height and in material. There will be some white stucco, white EFIS there that will match uh, to the left of that blue line. The contrast comes in um, there with the dark charcoal and black ACM panels. Uh, this is to designate the mini drop-off portion of the facility. Um, this is a contrast that is dictated by BMW and mini corporate, um, which is also looked favorably by, uh, by the architecture review board. They really appreciated the contrast from the white to the, the dark gray and black. Uh, again, the height of this building is, is, it matches the height of the existing structure. Um, and then we have our roof screening that goes above that on the right side there, you can see right there. We can move on to the next slide. Here you'll see some 3D renderings in, in, uh, of the front part of the uh, facility. Uh, this would be uh, the top left rendering would be from the entrance on Ledge Road into the BMW dealership. As you can see, the curved windows remain, the architectural elements of the front of the building remain. And as you look towards the rear of the lot, you'll see the dark, black and charcoal ACM panels of the mini uh, portion of the addition and ad adjacent to that, the white uh, stucco part of the addition that uh, matches the rest of the building. Next. As we move through the site, just as I talked about on the bird's eye images, we have the middle building, the car wash building. Um, as suggested by the ARB, it was pushed further uh, into the site away from the uh, service building. No customers will ever be going there through that car wash. It would just be a technician bringing the car through the car wash. Architecturally, uh, we are advised and uh, by the ARB to um, use some of the materials from the, from the front building. So that's why we chose to go with the black ACM metal panels uh, to play off of the uh, mini drop off area. And then on the bottom half of the car wash, you would see a ground fit face block that is charcoal in color. Uh, the storefront system is a clear anodized aluminum system similar to the front of the showroom. Um, and, and the block would then continue to the rear building, which is the service building um, that you'll see in rendering shortly. We're going to talk about the floor plans next for the service building first. Uh, as Craig alluded to previously in his uh, quick presentation, and uh, while, while Wilder was talking, um, this is the uh, the floor plan of the uh, lower level of the service department, um, getting a majority of the lifts, 24, all in a double loaded corridor with just two overhead doors, not only increases efficiency uh, for work for the servers technicians, uh, but it also is very environmentally friendly. Uh, we have high-speed overhead doors that go up and down very quickly, uh, eliminating the stress on the mechanical units for both heating and cooling purposes. 
the six overhead doors to the north side of this plan uh, would, as while they're discussed, are more quick service electronic type bays. Uh, the more advanced cars get, uh, the, they are computers after all, the more electronic work that has to be done. Um, will also be more of the work that would be done on the electric vehicles uh, for BMW as we move into a, a different uh, manufacturing world for cars. Also located on the first floor, we have the parts department centrally located for all technicians to be able to easily ac access. Previously discussed, uh, a technician would have to exit the old service building, walk into the showroom building, get to the parts department. So now the, uh, the efficiency of the workday is, is greatly increased and all activity is done within the confines of the four walls of this structure. And then the remaining of the lower level is just uh, uh, technician amenities. We have a break room and locker rooms um, for them to take breaks in. At the lower part of that floor plan, as Craig alluded to already, is, is the ramp as you slowly go up to get to the next level, which would be the rooftop parking. Um, after uh, deliberation with the uh, Architect Review Board, uh, when we decided to move towards a more residential look of the facility, the mansard roof went from 37 parking spaces down to 35 parking spaces, as the mansard roof is now three feet thick instead of the 12 inch thick wall we had previously, so constraining our parking spaces just a little bit. It is a 10 foot high wall that you will see in a section and also in the subsequent renderings. Um, it is, is, is residential in nature. Um, we thought, uh, in an effort with the architecture review board, uh, we thought this would be a more cohesive architecture to go along with our residential neighbors. The remainder of the second floor would be part storage and additional storage um, that would be accessed uh, via the staircase there. Now, we don't have anywhere really to put rooftop units for mechanical uh, uh, purposes for HVAC and heating, uh, so we have on, on, as Craig is highlighting there, uh, some rooftop units there and on the other side. Those not only are screened by our mansard roof, but there's also screening walls in front of them. And that material, that is a structural wall that will have insulation in it. And it also has uh, trespa panels, which is very similar to what you'll see in the rendering at the top of the ramp at the lower part of the, of the floor plan, Craig. Oh yeah, the trespa right. walls. Yep, we can go to the next one there. Again, a similar view just at the top of the parts department uh, as, as in conjunction with ARB, we've decided and with BMW's green initiatives to go for more sustainable uh, products, we have located solar panels um, that will hopefully tie, it hasn't been uh, determined yet, but hopefully tie into our electric uh, vehicle stage, uh, charging stations that um, we will be have on site. And next. Uh, elevation wise, uh, from ground floor to the top of the wall, uh, top of the building, not including the solar panels is 27 feet, one inches. As discussed, we have a ground face block at the majority of the lower level. It's a charcoal color in nature. It matches the car wash building. It's a very durable material, not only from the exterior, but from the inside use of the mechanics. Um, we use that a lot in a lot of the car dealerships that we design and build. Uh, at the top half of the building on all four sides is where we really started to go a little bit more uh, residential in nature. Uh, originally, we had proposed uh, a more commercial product, but now we we're going to do the, the hardy siding. It's in um, pearl gray is the color uh, trimmed out with white Azek trim. And that, that's a majority of that front facade that Craig is on. And then if you go to either of the two side facades, you'll see that as soon as we get past the parts area where Craig is and move to where the parking is, uh, we've opted to go for that mansard roof. So from the parking deck all the way to the top of that mansard roof, again, is 10 feet tall. Um, no one will be able to, you know, be able, as, as Katie's sections uh, through the site will show shortly, be able to see um, any cars parked there from, from any different angles. So at the bottom elevation there, uh, closest ones to our neighbors, uh, again, you'll see that mansard roof um, in the middle where the top of the ramp uh, uh, enters into where the parking is, we have a trespa panel. A trespa is a wood-like um, composite uh, material. Uh, it's a solid wall, so the no lights will be coming through, no sound will be coming, well, the sound will be uh, de um, uh, reduced by that wall, um, and it is a walnut color in nature. Uh, we feel that uh, it, the material breakup of that long facade was uh, an important element. Um, you could see there on that ramp, 
uh, on the angle, that four feet of uh, concrete uh, cast in place wall that uh, Craig was talking about while there was talking about uh, four feet was determined to be the optimal height to uh, for for headlights. Um, and really, a uh, majority of the cars that'll be going up there, compact cars, um, you know, you'll only see the top of them as they're driving through. So the next couple slides are going to see some renderings um, of this back service building. Oh, I'm sorry. First, we have that the cross section through the building um, where you see the mansard roof cutting through the ramp um, that 10 feet high right there that the cars will be to the right and uh, the ramp to the left. Um, architectural shingles, as, as discussed, again, a more residential feel. Okay, uh, and then the section to the left is at the top of the ramp. Uh, that is where uh, the trespass panels will be on top of the concrete block wall um, and have a, a, a what we think is kind of a fence feel. It's a residential feel at the top of that uh, the ramp. Renderings from the front uh, to supplement the elevations that were just shown. Um, as you can see from the front, we have that ground face block with the, with the pearl gray hardy siding um, and uh, the clear anodized aluminum storefront system. Um, and to contrast uh, the white and the light gray, we have the black anodized uh, canopies over the front uh, windows for the service technicians as they walk in. Um, just different angles. Um, you can start to see on the top right, the mansard roof there. Um, and on the bottom right, uh, this bird's eye view uh, that, frankly, if you were the only way you'd see this is if you were a bird uh, flying over the facility. Next. Uh, these are uh, starting on the top left, a view again from the trees uh, to show the very top uh, of the mansard roof from the neighbors. This would be kind of the corner of the neighbors on the dump. Uh, you see the top of the ramp with the trespa panels. Uh, contrasted to the right and left of that with the mansard roof or uh, black shingles. Top right rendering is from the, the back left corner of the service department. Um, this is really more to show the landscaping that Katie is going to be talking about uh, shortly. Uh, we have some evergreen trees and some uh, arborvitae and she'll locate those. Bottom left is at the top of the ramp. All the way to the left of this, you'll see the, the trespa panels uh, fence and in the middle, the mansard roof uh, that will have uh, siding on the inside. So again, more residential feel on the inside, as you can see, also see on the rendering on the lower right-hand side where the cars are parked. Okay, next. Yeah, we're, and, we're up to Katie. Uh, oh, we're up to Katie. So th that's right. The other uh, renderings that we produced are more uh, uh, landscape in nature. So Katie's going to speak to those in her presentation as the landscape architect. Any questions architecturally? Yeah. Can you do me one favor? Can you go back a second? It's Steve Ovani. Go back to, I think it might be um, slide two, A200, which is the building height. I just want to make sure everyone understands this. That's close enough. The height of the building is 17 feet, right? 27 yeah. feet. Oh, yeah, sorry. so the, the, the front of the building, the front of the building has two stories. So there's Correct. the parts department above the front of the building. So if you're measuring the height on the front or south side of the building, the side away from the condos, that would be a 27 foot tall building. If you because measure the height of the building in the back where the parking is, parking deck level is only 17 feet above uh, the first floor so the parking deck level is 17 feet above and then the the 10 feet above that is effectively going to be that mansard roof all the way around or that trestle wall so um, this part is the fence around the parking this is kind of where the cars would be so if you, if you go to the other hold on one second care if you go to the other elevation which is going to be i would say maybe an east elevation if you had it uh yes east uh, is this side right, right here right there. yep yeah okay that's good so the 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 part that's on the left hand side of the screen that's where the parts department is correct yes 17 feet and then okay. the right from, from hand, here to here is 27 feet 27 so feet 27, yes 27 feet. Sorry. yep and the solar panels on the roof if you go up to the other side of the door <laughs> it's 17 feet high plus a fake mansard roof which is 10 feet high that's correct so this is the, the the level where the cars will be parking 
and yep. this is that 10 foot parapet with the mansard roof so the cars are behind this in this view which is so that's basically a fake wall that you're just using you're making it you're making it six feet extra high to hide cars well 10 feet high yeah because it a normal parapet would need to be 42 inches cool. for safety right uh, uh and we're making it uh, 120 inches or 10 10 feet um and that is to provide that complete opaque visual barrier and also uh enjoy the the the, the sound attenuating qualities of that wall okay and, and then light attenuating qualities of that wall <laughs> and then and the other item that i just make sure everyone's on the same page I read in the, the narrative from Wilder Gleason that there's of the parking spaces on the roof, which is going to be 35 now, that's all for employee parking. Is that still correct? That's mostly going to be the case. That is the intent, right? So that uh, the, the, you know, might there be a service vehicle up there occasionally? Yeah, there might. But, but generally, uh, they're going to send the employees uh, up to the rooftop in the morning. Um, Maybe a handful of them will go out for lunch in the middle of the day, but most just walk or bring. Uh, and then the employees will leave again at the end of the day. So at, at night, at night, that parking lot should effectively be empty in case should there's one or two ser yeah. service cars. Okay. That's right. So, and, and we said earlier, I think there's like 68 people that work in the building. So of the 68 people, 35 are going to have their cars up there. Yeah, seven, it was uh, 70 something, but yeah. That thing went down from one. They went from eighty something to seventy something. Probably eighty. I thought it was six. It was seventy something to sixty something. Okay. So, 80, 86 employees down to seventy six when they were done. Okay. So in the morning. Wilder, can you say that again? Eighty six cars uh, employees oh, yeah. now, and okay. it'll be reduced to seventy six once all the changes are made. They're so, they're laying off employees. No, 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 they're going to move to uh, the sales department for pre-owned is going to move down to mini, and some okay. people will be transferred to the uh, well, stamp site. We'll move over here. I didn't hear you, Kara. Will mini service people move over here? Uh, I believe there will be some mini technicians coming over. Okay, so there's a shifting of employees, so it goes from 86 employees to 70, whatever. Uh, on site. It, it, we're not going to lay people off. We're just going I'm to. Just want to clarify what you were saying because you're like it was a reduction of employees. Correct. Well, but, reducing employees at the site is what I. Right. Mean. At this it's site. Like, at this site. Yeah. So, uh, so just to make sure on the same page, the 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 building, the mansard roof added six feet to Ten. the building in the back. Ten. And no, it's, it already had to be four feet, Karen. You need a you need a parapet wall of four feet. So that right, was and it's and total. total. Right. So put a mansard on top of the four foot knee wall. It's now it goes from four to ten, which is a different, which is a net increase of six. Right, it's still ten. Right. Is that right, Craig? Or yeah, or, you described it correctly, Steve. Uh, we see that the uh, you know we're we're doing this all for for benefit, right? For screening. Uh, and 27 is three feet lower than is allowed by zoning. Correct. And the, and the building is set back 33 feet from the property line when 20 feet is allowed by zoning. So 20 okay. feet is allowed. Okay. All right. So that's good. Now we're going to listen to Katie, who's going to tell us about the screening for this whole shooting match, right? Yeah. So Katie, uh, you said you wanted to control your own screen during your presentation. Uh, that would be great. Yes. And I'm just as soon as I figure out how to. Uh, Stop uh, sharing. There we go. The stop button. Uh, the stop well, we're button. We're getting this organized about share, screen sharing. I I had a question, a two-part question. One is, where's the HVAC equipment? And I assume it's on the roof someplace. Yeah, I'll uh, show you that. Second, when I've been in a modern, which, which may be ten years ago, uh, uh, dealer repair facility. You get all these worms hanging down from the ceiling uh, to attach to the uh, exhaust pipes while your car's being worked on. Um, in as much as it appears that most, if not all, of the repair work is going to be done inside, is there any special provision that has to be made for? Uh, getting rid of the car exhaust 
safely? And does that add to whatever noise the um, the neighbors might hear? We'll note we'll note your question, and um, we'll have uh, the dealership uh, address that. Okay. Uh, thanks. So, Katie, I think you should be able to share now. Yes, I'm just getting there. One second. Can everybody see my screen? Yep, looks good. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Katie Haas. I'm a licensed landscape architect in the state of Connecticut, uh, representing William Kenny Associates this evening to talk to you about the proposed landscape um, plantings as well as the lighting. Um, before I jump into the proposed conditions, I just wanted to walk through some of the existing conditions. Um, I'll be brief because uh, Wilder um, and Craig have walked through um, the existing conditions um, previously. So the site is surrounded to the north and east by Whole Foods. Um, as you can see here, where I'm outlining with my cursor, um, I-95 to the south. And to the west is Darien's Refuse Station, um, which you can, uh, west, sorry, west and um, south of the site is the Darien Refuse Station. Um, just between, um, just to the west of our site, between the Refuse Station and BMW's property is Cummings Brook, which you can see right here on my screen. Um, to the north of the site is Middlesex Commons, um, as you can see here, with two grouped housing units and garages abutting BMW's properties um, around the cul-de-sac in this location. Um, on, on BMW's property, the most southwestern portion is leased by the town, shown here. Um, and within the thin rectilinear portion of the property exists the showroom and office building. And the back portion of the property is for currently for inventory and the service garage located here. This is the area that is closest to the neighboring Middlesex Commons neighbors. Um, a man-made stormwater wetland is located to the southeastern portion of the property, which is overgrown with invasive plant material. And along the western portion of the property is a small portion of the woodland wetland system that borders Cummings Brook, which is located approximately right here. Um, something that was briefly mentioned by Wilder, but will become more visible through my presentation, is our site is recessed within the surrounding properties. The surface grade of Whole Foods parking lot is approximately six feet higher. The surface grade of Middlesex Commons property is eight to 10 feet higher. Um, and the surface grade of the refuse center is approximately one to two stories higher than the BMW's existing surface grade. So it's kind of like a tunnel <laughs> in, in here. Um, so. so I'll quickly um, run through some just existing photos. Um, as you, uh, photos one and two show the entrance to BMW. This is an image facing to the west or southwest, I should say, um, coming from the east uh, at the BMW property. As you can see, here is the um, uh, the showroom and the office building, as well um, as some existing landscaping. And at this uh, to the right is the entrance to Whole Foods parking. This is an image facing to the um, actually to the north, but coming. Uh, coming from the west down ledge road toward the entrance to our, our property. As you can see, um, this is where the man-made stormwater detention basin is. Um, there are some existing ornamental shrubs, and then, but within the wetland area, it is overgrown with knotweed um, and invasive vines. There are some existing deciduous trees along the road, as well as some existing pine trees that are unhealthy and um, in conflict with the, the wires that exist at the site today. Um, moving into the site, um, I'll be showing images three and four, which are of the showroom and office building. 
Um, I have actually night photos of the, the, these images just because I didn't have any day photos, <laughs> I included them. Uh, to the right of the, um, to the right of the picture, you can see the um, the change in elevation between the the dare uh, the BMW property and then the Whole Foods lot, as well as to the um, left of the picture, which is south of the site, um, the showroom and office space. Um, something I'd also like to know um, are these light fixtures. Um, the Taller light fixtures are located on the Whole Foods property, and then it's more apparent in the next picture, I, which I will show, um, are our light fixtures, which are um, lo mounted lower in grade. This is a view facing to the east with the um, office and showroom to the right, um, the, per the existing shed, and then Whole Foods to the, the left. And you can see here the difference in the elevation of the light fixtures. Um, our, these light fixtures are also angled, um, so they um, shine, and that's how you, why you can see, you're looking up at them so you can see the, the light source. Moving on to the um, back portion of our, of our lot, um, images five and six will show the inventory parking area, as well as some views toward Whole Foods, the Whole Foods lot, and the transition between the Whole Foods parking lot and our, our site. Um, this is looking back in the distance is the refuse station. Um, Coming Brooks is on the um, between the refuse station and this our lot. Um, Middlesex Commons is to the right. This corner of this building is the existing service garage, um, and then this is just inventory parking. Um, we have existing light fixtures, and you can see that the fixtures are actually at an, uh, mounted at an angle. Um, image six is looking uh, to the northeast at uh, Whole Foods lot. As you can see, there's a boulder slope um, that's pretty steep, and BMW's parking lot comes right to the edge of the slope at the top. That is all paved. Um, our property boundary actually starts at the bottom of the slope um, where my cursor is and goes north um, and ends more or less partly up the up the slope. Uh, so Really, all of this land is on Whole Foods property. Um, all of these trees that you see here are on Whole Foods property. Um, going around the service garage to the back of the site, uh, we'll have image seven and eight. Seven shows the northern property boundary, and eight shows just a view to the north of um, relationship of the condos, um, Middlesex common condos to um, our site. So image seven shows the Middlesex Commons to the, the right of the page to the north, and then our inventory lot to the left, which is um, to the south of the site. I want to, to take just a look at this light fixture that we've noted here. Um, our property boundary is two feet to the north of this light fixture. Um, this fixture is mounted at 14 feet in height, um, but very close to the Middlesex Commons property. Also, all of this uh, boulder slope is on the Middlesex Commons property. Hmm. Um, image eight is looking to the north at the Middlesex Commons property. You can see that there's existing unit condo units that do have windows that face out onto the Middlesex Commons. There is an existing screening hedge that the condos have um, installed themselves as well as some um, smaller screening hedges um, that were also installed. There is an eight foot screening fence just to um, um, just on the back side of the um, uh, the condo's property be right before the boulder um, wall and then our parking lot. Uh, you can see on the right side of the photo in the distance there's an existing um, mature stand of deciduous trees. It's pretty robust and uh, um, a healthy uh, tree environment. Uh, it is a little bit shadier over on the, this side of the site, which is the east side of our site. Um, I'd like to point out that these are um, residential units. However, um, there are some structures that are existing garages. Um, and then just the last photo I'll show is a view um, similar to what Wilder had shown from the over our parking lot. 
Um, I'd like just to take a moment to um, note something that stood out to us was there's the existing screening hedge around the Middlesex Commons property. There, uh, there, the Middlesex Commons has two trees along their western, two tree uh, hedges along their western, um, the portion of their property. There's an existing screening hedge that's about 30 feet in height. Uh, these trees, uh, arborvitae, are very mature. Um, they were planted a few years before the um, the hedge that you see here, which is about um, 18 to 20 feet in height. I'd also like to note that this picture was taken a little over a year ago, so these trees have already grown about two to three feet in height. There's also some existing arborvitae trees um, where my cursor is um, in between this um, this condo unit and an existing garage. There's also the eight foot screening fence, which I had pointed out earlier, and then as you come toward our property, the boulder wall um, and our service building. So now I'll move into proposed conditions. Um, zoom out a little bit. <laughs> Just to orient everybody with our um, plan, this uh, white box is the proposed service building. Um, here's the proposed addition, um, the existing building, the proposed car wash, Middlesex Commons we're showing um, to the north of our site here. We view the proposed plantings in four parts, the wetland buffer enhancements, um, the parking lot plantings, um, evergreen tree screening plantings, and plantings on the neighboring property. Um, native plantings are proposed within and around the man-made stormwater wetland at the southwestern corner of the property located here. Um, Native shrub and ground cover buffer plantings are proposed at the northwestern portion of the property where there is a small portion of the woodland wetland system that borders coming brooks located right here. Plantings around the parking lot include deciduous trees um, selected per the Darien commercial design guidelines. Uh, below, um, below the trees, we are proposing various shrubs and native ground covers. Um, an, ex an evergreen hedge is proposed along the entirety of the northern property boundary. And I'll zoom in just for clarity, just to talk about this area. We feel it's the most important portion of the, the planting. Um, so we're proposing an evergreen screen that extends the northern property boundary and then uh, turns south along the eastern um, property boundary. We're proposing 43 20 to 22 foot green giant arborvitae spaced at seven feet on center and 10 uh, 20 to 22 foot Norway spruce trees spaced 10 feet on center. Here's where the Norway spruces are proposed and here's where the green giant arborvitae are proposed. We've selected the green giant arborvitae um, because they are fast growing, um, robust uh, screening hedge, the neighbors do have existing arborvitae on their property, um, as I had shown in previous images. They, um, and when we had met with the neighbors uh, earlier this year, they had shown um, approval for having uh, the arborvitae versus the Norway spruce in this area um, that it was preferred. We had met with their landscaper and the, um, some of the neighbors to discuss and walk a uh, part of the um, neighboring property. So I'd like to um, jump through some sections now, and I think this will help clear up some of the questions that had um, come about earlier in the presentation. Katie, it's Steve Albany. Yeah. Would you mind going back one section to that other page? Sure. I think while there is initial presentation, he said he was gonna put eight abrovites um, or give the money to middle system to put eight abrovites on their site. Thank you, and yes, I meant, I meant to talk about that. I appreciate it. Okay, thank you. So we've, um, as we had seen in the previous photos, there's, um, these are the existing condo units that we were looking at and the existing photos. We have two garages, existing garages, and then there's some units that do have, um, do abut our property, but um, as well as Whole Foods property. There's the, um, we've um, drawn in the existing 
screening hedge that it was shown in the previous images. These are um, some existing trees. So what we when we met with the neighbors earlier this year, we talked about different locations to um, to improve the screening on their property. Um, and we've proposed to connect the two screening hedges um, with eight uh, arborvitae at 20 to 22 feet in height. So if I go back to this image quickly, uh, we're proposing the eight arborvitae trees here. Then those will be like seven feet on center also? Yes. Okay. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Yep, so I'll jump into the sections, which also will um, talk about those trees as well. Um, so we're proposed, um, we have two sections drawn. Sorry, I'm moving, hope no one's getting motion sickness. <laughs> uh, we have two sections drawn, AA1 and BB1, as well as an elevation along the northern um, side of the proposed service building. So I'll walk through AA1, which starts at the north and ends at the south, cutting through the condo units um, over uh, the screening, the proposed screening, as well as through the proposed service building, um, and then just tapers off at the end of our property boundary. So um, just to start off with existing conditions, we did explore what the existing conditions were um, with this section before um, reviewing what the proposed conditions were. Starting from the northern end, um, where the uh, existing Middlesex Commons property, we have the uh, existing condo unit um, where, where we have um, included sight lines onto our property. We've taken these sight lines based off of field observations and um, where we've collected information and we're showing the first floor approximately three feet above the existing grade which is at elevation 159. Um, we're showing the sight lines coming from an average, um, the average height of a person at five feet, six inches. Um, the first floor we're showing, the second floor we're showing nine feet above with a one foot floor. So it's, uh, we're showing it to the uh, second floor, 10 feet above the, um, the first floor. W again, with uh, five feet, six inches for the average uh, height of a person. So this um, overall that totals 18.5 feet above the existing grade of 159, which will um, totaling 77 uh, elevation 77.6. So we'll um, I'll touch on that again when I go over the proposed conditions. I just wanted to bring that to everybody's uh, attention. Um, shown in the existing section, this cut through shows the existing uh, screening trees that the neighbors already have installed on their property the eight foot screening fence, the boulder slope that has some vegetation growing within it, um, the existing deciduous trees in the uh, background. Um, and then on our property, it goes right to uh, the inventory parking lot. In the distance, we've shown um, the existing service building um, and then slopes up toward the leased property from the, the town. As you can see, these dashed lines are the sight lines that cut through um, our property from the first floor. Um, we took the uh, sight line from the uh, the eight foot screening fence as the low point. So you uh, the first the first floor um, the first floor uh, views can see just over the screening fence, but can't see the parking lot on our um, the inventory parking lot, just the parking lot. Um, in the distance on the leased property. The, um, that is to say that they're, without taking into consideration the existing screening tree, which does block the entirety of the view. Um, from the second floor, you can see down, um, uh, again, the uh, existing arborvitae screen does block this view, but you can see down into our parking lot. So the existing views are primarily of the, the parking um, today. So then I'll move over to the proposed conditions. Um, starting from the north, um, where the condo uh, property is, uh, as I had mentioned before, the, we had taken the second floor sight line at elevation 77.6, uh, 
and our mansard roof is at 78.08. So that is why, um, uh, based on the information that we have, the, there is no view of the parking um, within the, uh, the roof deck from the neighboring properties. And that doesn't take in consideration the existing trees, um, which is shown in black here. We've also added into this section the uh, a projected growth of the at the projected growth of the trees that in two to three years these uh, the existing trees will be 25 to 30 feet in height. And as you can see, once they reach that height, it completely blocks the view from the condos property. Um, we have the eight foot screening fence, um, the slope, the boulder slope. Um, the existing grade, as you saw before, um, stays relatively flat. Um, per Craig's comment, we are uh, mounding the soil up toward the, our building so that the trees can be, our proposed evergreen trees can be a little um, higher. So we are proposing 20 to 20 foot green giant and spruce trees uh, that are shown in the forest green. And then they're showing the projected growth in three to four years at 25 to 30 feet in height um, in dark gray. We're assuming that the first year that the trees are installed, that they there won't be any growth to the trees. So that's why we're proposing that it's going to take a few more years for them to reach the height than the existing um, trees. Just to the south of the ex uh, proposed evergreen trees on our property is the ramp with the screening um, with the screening fence. And then as you move toward the south, the, the roof deck parking with the mansard roof um, as you, uh, the service building. As you go toward the south, there is just the, the drive that um, Craig had spoken about, um, as well as some more uh, parking trees um, and the parking island. I'd like to note in this section that we do have proposed light fixtures, which I'll talk about a little later. Um, on within the proposed roof. However, they're all located below the, um, the mansard roof. Um, these fixtures are mounted at seven feet in height. We do have some pole mounted fixtures, which I will get into their location, which are 14, mounted at 14 feet in height. So these fixtures on the side of the building will be completely blocked by the building. Now I'll move on to Section B B one, which cuts Katie, north. Katie, can I interrupt yeah. for one second again? Uh, sure. Just to make sure we're on the same page. When you talk about A A to A one, that is everything that's east of that line, correct? Yes. Yep. Line? Yep. Yes. So all so, those tree, all the planting you do is east of the of that line. Correct. Because west of that line, you have existing a GT and AR and a GT. Which is a, I can't even pronounce that word. Wow. Oh, the thornless honey locust tree. Yeah, the thornless honey locust, and then an AR next to it is a, what the heck is that? Uh, October glory red maple. So that that's an, uh, we have updated the plan since. Um, but those are existing trees. Uh, right. Proposed yep. trees. So I'll, I'll just quickly yeah, go through Proposed trees, the Steve. Proposed trees. So go down, slide it down a little bit, tiny bit more. Yep. Okay. Oh, this is new. Oh, this is the this is the proposed planting plan. I just wanted to um, show okay. your. These are the trees that we're showing in that section. Okay, because um, which from October from December twenty third, there was another GT and AR left to the existing to the right of the existing GT. Okay. So. We have submitted updated plans. Um, this is dated uh, February 2nd, yep. our most updated plans that show the um, GT and TC. Okay. So all those arbor uh, and green giants, all that stuff is to the right or east of line A to A1. Understand? Okay. Yes. Got it. Thank you. I just I just want to make sure you're clear too. But to the west or left of that section line, there is still other proposed planting, which is the spruces. So there's more okay. proposed planting to the west. Yes, the plant the the screening plantings extend the length of the northern property boundary. Oh, okay. So the the AR and GT, which is the thornless honey locust and the glory 
October Glory and Red Maple, they got switched out with, um, would you just say Blue Spruces or something? Oh, wait, so Spruce. We, so we're proposing uh, Little Leaf Linden and Thornless Honey Locust along the western no, uh, I got portion it, I got of the it. property and then the yeah. to the south of the proposed service building. But everything to the north of the service building is screening trees. Got it. Okay. Thank you. Um, so I'll jump into section BB, which just is a cut through closer, um, more toward the eastern portion of the property, showing a different um, view of the ramp, as well as extending further into the Middlesex Commons property to show how the um, the other condo is located on the opposite side of the cul-de-sac um, uh, interact with our with our proposed conditions. Um, this also faces east, just to orient um, the commission. So starting on the north end of our section, again, facing east, uh, we'll ha we have a proposed dwelling. Um, I'd like to note that we have noted the, the roof deck or the roof portion of the, the dwelling um, and the eave, there's no views above the eave and then the peak of the roof is, is drawn. So on the furthest end of the cul-de-sac, which is about 275 feet away from our property, are some existing condos and I will sh go into a photo that I have um, of their view of our site um, a little bit later. Um, there are some existing trees on the uh, Middlesex Common property between uh, our property boundary and um, their views from the this existing dwelling. Um, and then there's a mix of uh, garages as well as a unit um, a more along the west uh, eastern portion of the property, which I had described earlier, which would be, um, this is the furthest building, um, this is a garage, um, and then these are some condo units, as well as um, another garage right here. Um, the, uh, the existing garage ex uh, driveway extends all the way to an existing wall. Um, this is all paved. There are two existing um, evergreen trees um, in areas where um, there's only space to plant. And then there's a slightly less um, steep slope in this location where the section was taken. And then as you can see in the forest green is our proposed evergreen trees at installation, which is 20 to 22 feet height. And then at their projected growth rate in three to four years, approximately 25 to 30 feet in height. Um, as you can see, the service building is completely screened at the um, tree's maturity. Um, to the south of the proposed screening trees is um, uh, our proposed ramp that will lead up to the service building rooftop parking, um, the parapet wall, um, and then our mansard roof at elevation 78. Um, I've penciled in the uh, existing service garage here. I'll zoom in so you can see how the bu new building compares to the existing service garage. Um, now moving on to uh, elevation CC, which cuts uh, west to east and faces north um, along our property. We um, are grateful for, we think this is one of the most important um, elevation studies of the site and want to just thank the um, ARB for requesting that we put this together. It is a little um, complicated, so bear with me. Um, there's a lot of information here. <laughs> So the elevation depicts the northern side of the service building facing toward the Middlesex Commons property. The foreground, um, we're showing in the foreground the bold dashed line, as you see here. This is the existing service building. Um, proposed. Sorry, proposed, thank you. This is the proposed service building, not the existing service building. Um, to the, the right of the page, which is east of the property, is the uh, proposed ramp. And as you can see, it angles up 
toward the roof deck parking, which is shown um, here. Starting from the west, which is the left of the page, um, this thick dark black line is the proposed grade. Um, and as you can see, the grade rises as we move to the east um, as it mounds against the proposed service building. To, just to the north of the proposed service building is the screening head, the 20 to 20 foot height screening hedge of spruce trees and green giant arborvitaes that is shown here. It is shown in the forest green color here. We have also sketched in the proposed trees at their mature height uh, to 25 to 30 feet, um, which is this line right here. Um, as you can see, they will completely screen the proposed service building in three to four years. To the north of the proposed screening trees, located on the Middlesex Commons property, is the existing eight-foot screening fence, shown here. It ex extends the majority of the property line, except for in between the two Middlesex Commons garages located here, where there's an existing um, existing wall. To, on the north side of the fence, there are pockets of existing arborvitae hedges on the neighboring property that are shown in black. Here, here, and over here. Um, the largest grouping to the west um, of, of the Middlesex condo um, property and then the uh, central uh, arborvitae hedge will be connected by the eight um, 20 to 22 foot green giant arborvitaes as you can see here. We've also penciled in their approximate height, the mature height. Um, as you can see here, to match the existing height of the, um, the largest screening trees to the west of the, the property. To the north of those screening trees, we have located the proposed condo units, garages, um, and then the condo units along the eastern side. And then in the background of the elevation, we're showing the outline of the most northern condos located approximately seven, 275 feet away from the property boundary, which you can see here. There's also some existing deciduous trees, which I had touched on um, before along the eastern, um, northeastern side of the, the property. So again, Katie, this is from BMW looking north. I'm sitting in the BMW parking garage or parking lot looking towards Middlesex Commons. Yes, I'll go back to my key plan here. So the section, uh, the elevation is cut just to the north of the proposed service building looking at Middlesex Commons. Understood. Thank you. So that, um, that sums up our sections that we prepared for the, the property, and I'll just jump into some existing condition photos taken from the Middlesex Commons um, at the BMW site. So this is an image taken from a balcony of the um, facing south um, with Cummings Brook to the right or, or the right of the image on uh, the refuse station in the distance. Um, and then the inventory lot you can see uh, here on our property. Uh, this is taken from a balcony view and you can see the existing screening hedge in the foreground that BMW has. This picture was taken in 2019. So these trees already have um, approximately two to uh, approximately three to four feet of growth on them within the two years of um, growing seasons. Uh, so that's one view. Um, this is another view looking to the south um, at uh, BMW's property, 
you can see the um, antenna in the distance on the uh, refuse uh, Darien property. Uh, this tube on my left is a garage, um, and to my right is the condo, the most westerly condos on the uh, Middlesex Commons property. There's some existing screening trees already proposed, um, and per our, our planting plan, we are connecting these screening trees with the screening trees I showed in my the previous image. The next view is taken at the front steps of the um, condos uh, on the office on the northern side of the cul-de-sac, looking facing toward uh, the BMW property. Uh, as you can see in the distance, here is the existing service space, as well as um, here are the two garages that we have been talking about. Um, the wall between the garages. There are some shrubs located on either end of the um, the garage courtyard. Um, some condos to the, the right of the image, as well as some condos to the left, and then um, an, another garage. As you can see, there's some substantial existing deciduous trees between these views and our property. Um, I, I'd also like to note in this image that we, when we were walking the BMW property, we were looking at to opportunities to, uh, oh, when we were walking the Middlesex Commons property, we were looking at opportunities to um, offer more screening up um, on their property and had determined that the area um, over to the west was the best location as there's no uh, there's no room to plant between the two garages here as it's all paved except for where they already have existing trees as well as um, to the left of the image there are many existing deciduous mature trees uh, so we didn't uh, uh, after discussions with their landscape, we didn't want to disturb the root systems of those existing trees. Can I ask you a question right about at that exact spot? Sure. See that if you zoom in a little bit right there, that where your pointer is right now, that's an existing stockade fence. Yes. Mm -hmm. I was there that's Sunday night. Is that Whole Foods' fence or is that Middlesex Commons fence? Do you or, or do you not know? Let me go to. It's Middlesex Commons fence. Okay, because so, it's, it's right, you just had it. It's right between building unit 50 and the garage. Yes, correct. So right. it's you approximately have here. Uh, okay, it's on Middlesex Commons. Okay, because then if you go to the other side, there's the decorative fence between the two garages. Yep. Right, and then between that garage and the other unit, which I think is unit 71. Mm -hmm. Yep, here's it. There's no stockade fence. There so, is a stockade fence. But there's there wasn't one in the last picture you showed. There wasn't one there Sunday night. Between, Between the, garage. it's there. Yeah. It's was screened by the vegetation. If you so if you that. look at this image right here, this is taken between Unit 71 and the garage, right here. So, yep. The stockade fence is here. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Got it. So there's no portion of the property that's not uh, blocked by fence, eight foot screening fence, the wall or um, the back of the uh, wall of the garage or, or unit. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. What about the blue sky that they can see now? The, say, uh, the blue sky? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. We, 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 didn't, we didn't look at that. <laughs> well, we did. We, ha we have a rendering of the proposed building in a very similar image, and it doesn't go above that tree line you see in the distance. So we are not blocking any blue sky that you see in this photo with the proposed building. Oh, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that. I, I'm glad you didn't look at it, but I'm glad you did. Uh, my my apologies. I I thought you were talking about up here. <laughs> um, we let me uh, jump to my next image. Uh, gives them light, which would could potentially be adversely impacted. That's why I was asking about it. Understood. Mm -hmm. um, so this is uh, uh, one of uh, renderings that Claris Construction helped prepare. That might help prepare, um, showing the condos to the um, the east. Um, and these con uh, the condos to the, the west as well as the garages. And you can see in the distance here, I'll zoom in, is the uh, mansard roof 
the um, showing the elevation up here. And so it it doesn't completely That's block. Um, I'm sorry. That's very helpful. Okay, great. Um, and you can see the stockade fence here as well as the screening trees proposed um, over here. And um, just to note that the we can see the mansard roof when the uh, screening trees proposed on our property are just installed, but as um, time goes on, the will completely screen out the. Um, uh, so the mansard roof. Is is that mansard roof? Is it six feet on top of a four foot wall, or is it is it ten feet on top of a four foot wall? The, the total height from the roof deck to the top of the mansard roof is ten feet. Um, right, I don't know so which part is asphalt sing shingles and which part is the hardy plank siding. It, it's about 50-50. The, 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 the hardy siding comes up about five feet, and then above that, it's about five feet, uh, give or take, on, on for the asphalt shingles. So you, you technically made the building five feet higher because of the mansard roof to, to block a view. Yeah, just just brief history. This was the latest iteration with ARB. Previously, we had a 10-foot high wall that was all that trespa material, and it looked more like a fence material. Um, okay. And then we are, to, are just to fit in with the residential style. We went with the mansard asphalt shingled roof. Okay, but if, if that went away, the building would be five feet shorter from this right, view. You would, you'd see you there would be potential to see cars and and light uh, would be you know easily and sound. So we we stuck with the height. Understood. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, so then um, just this, I wanted to include this last photo. This is a photo I'm standing in the cul-de-sac facing west. So I'm looking at the western property boundary, which uh, abuts the town of Darien with uh, Cummings Brook right behind it. This is the um, Middlesex Commons existing screening hedge. And as you can see, it's very robust you, uh, and a very dense screening hedge. And this is what we're looking to um, mimic and recreate and extend along our property boundary uh, for as screening for the Middlesex Commons uh, residents. Now, um, so I, that's that that wraps up my the lighting, uh, the planting portion of my presentation and I'll jump into um, lighting now. Um, so Last uh, February of 2020, we performed a study of the existing light levels at the site. Um, we learned that there uh, is existing light trespass over the property line uh, along the Middlesex Commons property. Um, however, most of the light, it seems like, comes from the Whole Foods property uh, are, are along our property boundary, except for a few outliers um, uh, within the Middlesex Commons property. I also we also looked at the existing light fixtures at night, and as you can see, you can uh, the light fixtures are um, at an angle that allow you to see the light source and can appear bright from uh, the neighboring properties. As I had mentioned uh, previously uh, with uh, an existing conditions image, uh, the picture shown in photo six is two feet away from the uh, from our property line. Um, uh, along the northern property line. Um, I'd also like to mention that all of the existing fixtures are connected to a single photocell that turns on at dusk and then off at dawn. And none of these fixtures are, um, are dimmed. Um, actually, very recently we received this image from the neighbors and we um, we value these images they're they're great um, just to help us see and become better planners for um, for the site and the the comments were that they could see um, the existing light fixtures on our property which are shown um, just below the uh, the peak of the garage roof here the the fixtures in the distance I believe are um, on nine uh, i95 or um, on the refuse the town of Darien's property. So we can't do anything about those light fixtures, but we're um, definitely making improvements on our property where we can. So any of the low fixtures to the ground is what is on um, BMW's site. 
Uh, there are fixtures in the foreground. These are um, different than the types of fixtures that we'll be proposing on our property, which are full cutoff light fixtures. So we won't be able to see the light source um, from the from neighboring properties, which I will go into in a more detail now. So Katie, those two lights you sit there, those are whole food lights, right? One, two. Mm -hmm. So these, this picture the, is the looking one, the one to, to the, the right. Yeah, the one to the left of the garage. Here, over here. Yep, those two. Yep. This this picture is looking southwest at our uh, back property lot. So it's looking um, from if this is north, the north side of our lot. Um, their condo, I think, is over here, looking to the southwest. Um, so those light fixtures are are, are on our property. Oh, okay. Those two, those two sitting there. These two are on our property. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you. So the lighting plan, um, just to provide some information, uh, shows the proposed light fixture images of the proposed light fixtures along the right hand side of the page. Uh, we have foot candle measurements. A foot candle is the illuminance on one square foot surface from a uniform light source. And that's how um, we measured the, the light levels within the site. Um, we have a lumineer schedule, which describes the fixture um, and then the quantity and um, type. All of the proposed light fixtures are full cutoff fixtures and dark sky compliant, meaning no light will project at 90 degrees or above the fixtures enclosure. I'll start from the eastern side of the property and work my way uh, to the west and then to the north uh, to describe the, the proposed light fixtures. There are existing light fixtures um, along, uh, along the eastern and northern side of the front uh, part of our lot. These fixtures are proposed to remain. However, we will adjust the fixtures so that they angle down and don't uh, are compliant with um, the full cutoff 90 degree um, exposure requirement. Uh, the existing light, uh, existing light fixtures are to be relocated throughout the parking lot and adjusted um, just as the existing fixtures at the front um, to comply with the full cutoff requirement um, and not project light more than 90 degrees above the fixtures enclosure. These fixtures are all mounted at 14 feet um, from the uh, fixture down to the um, finished grade. New wall light fixtures will be mounted to the proposed addition. Um, the tallest will be mounted at 14 feet. New fixtures will be mounted to the proposed service building. All of these fixtures are mounted eight feet or less. So we, um, the existing fixtures within our back lot are mounted at 14 feet. We are now mounting um, fixtures at eight feet from the, the ground level. This doesn't include the, the rooftop fixtures, which I'll talk about in a minute. So I'll just zoom in a little here to take a look at the proposed service building. Uh, one fixture I'd like to bring to your attention is this WM5 fixture, which is on the northern side of our building facing north. This, um, this fixture is, mount, is approximately 32 feet away from the property boundary. And as you um, can recall from the planting plan, we have 20 to 25 foot screening trees planted between this fixture and the property boundary. Um, the rest of the ball mounted fixtures will be at eight feet in height. Fixtures are proposed within the parapet wall along the northern side of the, the ramp, um, the south side of the parapet, the northern parapet wall within the ramp. Um, these fixtures will face away from the uh, Middlesex Commons property and will be recessed into the wall so they won't be visible. There are two types of fixtures proposed uh, for the rooftop parking. Um, wall mounted, and then pole mounted. These fixtures are mounted at seven feet or lower. Um, so they'll be completely screened by the mansard roof. These fixtures are shown at their full brightness. And as you can see, over there is no trespass of light over the property line along the Middlesex Commons property or the town property. Uh, 
Um, as a response to some of the concerns from the neighbors that we've received about the light fixtures, as we understand um, they're looking down at the site, um, we've reviewed the lighting conditions and are proposing that the light fixtures to the west of our service gate, so from the proposed addition to the west and around the service uh, proposed service building, will be dimmed to 50% of the proposed brightness um, after hours of operation and only return to full brightness when activated by motion. Each fixture will react individually um, when motion is detected. So after uh, the fixture is detected by motion, it will turn to its full brightness, but then return back to the dim state. And um, my last slide, I just included a sample image of what a full um, cutoff light fixture looks like. The uh, fixture is recessed within the, um, the shield and it casts down. And as you can see, when looking at it from above, you're not seeing um, the source of light. So I, um, that's the end of my presentation. I want to thank you for your time um, and uh, answer any questions or I'll pass the mic over to John Canning to talk about traffic. I think that's great, Katie. Thank you. Appreciate your time. And I'll answer thank the you. questions as we went along. Okay. Brad, I'm going to share my screen again. All right, I'm stuck. So we have Jess Wiley, just so we're on the same page, it's now quarter to 10 or 20 to 10. Left, we have John Canning and then Martin Schiff, who's your acoustic consultant. Correct. And then okay. I'll just wrap up. Okay. And then um, do we need um, uh, Mike Galante to speak after? Mike can speak this meeting, which is Mark's second. All right, great. All right, fine. Yeah, thank um, you, Mr. Chairman. Welcome. Go ahead, sir. Just say your name for the record and your, and your association, please. Sure. Uh, my name is John Canning. I work for Kimley Horn. I'm a professional engineer licensed to practice in the state of Connecticut. And I was retained to undertake a traffic and parking analysis for the proposed application. Uh, as has been indicated to you already by uh, Paula and Wilder, the proposed changes really are to improve customer experience, reduce wait time, and keep up with ever-changing competition and provide brand consistent experience. So we uh, prepared our study and we provided it to you in a memorandum dated January 13th. We visited the site several times. We observed uh, drop, vehicle drop-off operations. We conducted driveway traffic counts. We determined the current traffic volumes generated by the existing facility, as well as future traffic volumes that would be generated by the facility. Uh, the changes to the facility, if you can just change that, please, Craig. Um, I'm sure you're aware there's one new service bay there's approximately 14,000 square feet of new space. Most of it, or a good portion of it, is the new vehicle intake building. Uh, there will be 10 fewer employees. The mini service will move over from 154 Post Road, but the pre-owned sales will move back to 154 Post Road. Uh, there is a new vehicle intake building. Intake is by appointment only, and right now it occurs outside, closer to the street. With this new building, it will be inside and further from the street. Uh, there's new vehicle intake technology. There will be sensors in the floor that will read each vehicle's computer and pre-populate the intake form, so it will make the intake process quicker and more efficient. Um, the new car wash and vacuum facility will be relocated out of the back lot, consolidated into one building, and moved to the center of the site, and there will be two fewer parking spaces. Uh, the study findings, basically, um, there are, based on our observations, there are no current traffic, parking, or operational issues. The existing facility generates a maximum of approximately 106 trips in the uh, peak hour, that's in the morning. Uh, there will be an imperceptible increase in vehicles serviced per day. We believe it's plus three. A nominal increase in facility traffic, about four additional trips in the peak hour. And this is not even accounting for the reduced trips that, that are more frequently associated with online pre-shopping. When you go to buy your car now, you go online and you look at where you can get the best price and you don't go visit as many showrooms. Uh, vehicle intake queuing capacity is going to be increased by up to nine vehicles. 
the combined car washing and vacuuming operation will reduce on-site traffic by more than 280 trips a day because right now they've got to come out of one facility and then go around and go back into the other one. They're small trips, but uh, they still occur on the back lot and they will be reduced. It won't happen uh, with only one facility. Uh, there'll be improved vehicular circulation internal to the site. It's a little wider now. There's two aisles, so uh, delivery vehicles will be able to go around uh, into the back of the site, turn around and come back out. The site's been designed to accommodate emergency emergency vehicles. Uh, obviously, there'll be improved comfort and efficiency of drop-off and pickup operations. And uh, based on our analysis, there will be little to no change or no perceptible change in traffic activity at Ledge Road. Um, there will be a dramatic, in our opinion, reduction in traffic activity in the rear lot, reducing the number of parking spaces from 73 to 43. We're removing the car wash, which uh, is visited by 72 loaner vehicles and 72 service vehicles each day, removing the, the car vacuum. So there are 72 loaners going into that and come out of that, and 70 vehicles, 72 vehicles being serviced go into that and come out of that each day. We are increasing the number of bays from, 20, from, from 6 to 30, which is an increase of 24, and this will add about 60 additional entering and exiting trips per day. And the parts department is being moved over to the rear lot, and that will increase about 10 trips per day entering and exit. But there will be a net reduction of uh, over 400 trips in the rear lot each day. And specifically for the 35 uh, rooftop service building parking spaces, as Craig already mentioned to you, they're primarily to be used by uh, service building employees. So basically, the employees will come in in the morning, about 35 of them. They'll leave in the afternoon. A handful of them may go to lunch in the afternoon, though many of them just walk over to Whole Foods or bring their own lunch. And at the busiest time, there'll only be one or two cars per minute in the morning as employees arrive and in the afternoons. Uh, based on this analysis, as summarized in our memorandum, the proposed action results in minimal changes to traffic activity at the site. Uh, there's increased queuing capacity and enhanced technology to make the check-in process more efficient. Uh, the parking lot has been designed to accommodate fire apparatus, apparatus and be more efficient for trucks. Uh, I do see Mr. Galante on the call. He issued a memorandum. He reviewed our memorandum. Um, he indicated that the new vehicle in bu building intake building will enhance the customer experience, improve customer safety. He had some minor recommendations, including adding a stop sign, a stop line, and a double yellow line uh, at the site driveway, but noted that there will be little or no change in traffic. So um, as Wilder and Paula indicated, it's really trying to keep up with the Joneses and uh, there will be no real traffic increase uh, from the proposed action. Was that Thank you, sir. Appreciate it, very quick. Can I just ask you one math question? Sure. It's, you, we talk about the car washes or, or changing the trips in the car washes. Is that the number of car washes in a day, or is that is a trip going in one end, in one side, and out the other side? Is that a, is that a trip? So basically, uh, they process today. They process 72 vehicles a day. So they service 72 vehicles, and every vehicle they service, they wash and they vacuum. So it goes into the the car wash, it comes out of the car wash, and then it goes into the vacuum, and it comes out of the vacuum. In addition, when somebody comes in to get their car service, they're given a loaner vehicle. So you've got 72 loaner vehicles that have to be cleaned and uh, vacuumed at the end of the day. So those vehicles are also processed. So between the Gazintas and the Gazautas and the loaners and the service vehicles and the washing and the vacuuming, it's hundreds of trips. All right. So it's so if you combine washing and vacuum in one spot, you by default lost, you cut it in half. Exactly. All right. That's fine. Because I'm doing the math. With, it's saying a hundred that would be you washing a car every 2.4 minutes and it, it's that's impossible okay well no well, but it's 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 a total of 144 vehicles washed that's fine that makes that makes a little bit of sense if you do math if you do the math it makes that makes more sense okay good because it's only a 12 hour day i mean i can't drop off my car there earlier than six and i got to pick it up by six correct that's correct you do it so you, that you're doing uh, 142 and 12 divided equals yeah. So you're doing 12. You're doing 12 cars an hour. 
right? And if it's you take an hour divided by 12, you're doing one car every five minutes. And it seems like a lot of cars, but I get it. It's not 2.4. Okay, thank you. But, All right, now I understand. Steve, it's separate lines, and each of them has. So you're running it through the vacuum, then you're running it through the va uh, the car wash now, and that right. adds additional. It doubles the trips, basically. Right. But it's there's no way you can wash a car in 2.4 minutes. I don't care how fast you are. <laughs> and I've been there. I got my car washed. It takes longer than, than two and a half minutes to get your car washed. <laughs> Okay, that's great. Thank you, sir. Appreciate your, your time. All right, Thank so you. If there's no further questions, we'll turn to Martin. Uh, Martin Schiffer. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Wilder. Uh, my name's Martin Schiff. I'm an acoustical consultant with Lally Acoustical Consulting uh, with offices in New York City. Uh, I evaluated the uh, the noise and acoustics picture of the proposed project in comparison with the uh, current operations to determine if there would be any noise impacts associated with the with the project. Um, so, uh, Craig, if you go to the next slide, the uh, we started off by delineating you know, what are the potential noise impacts from what's being proposed here. Uh, so, first we have changes in uh, the, the vehicle counts, accessing the rooftop parking deck and using the ramp which builds off of John's traffic study that you just heard about. Um, and we looked at that both on a, on a daily basis and during this, this AM peak hour where employees are gonna be arriving to park uh, for their shift. Uh, we looked at stationary noise from parked cars, things like car doors slamming when, again, when people are arriving in the morning. We looked at noise from the proposed rooftop air conditioning units. Um, there's six units lined up on along the south side of the parking deck. Uh, we had access to really detailed manufacturer noise ratings for each of these units. They, they send these things off to a lab and, and then they can publish precisely how loud they are so we can calculate how much noise will transmit from them. And then we looked at the uh, potential impacts of relocating the, the car wash lane uh, and the, the drying and vacuuming functions. So moving on. Um, to determine if we're seeing a noise impact from, from each of these aspects, we evaluated them against current operations, again, from the traffic study that, that John produced, uh, you know, how many cars were, are moving around the site right now and how many will be. Uh, and then for the car wash aspect, we actually went out and measured how loud the car wash operation was um, at the site. Uh, we can compare these things to the current background noise, which we monitored on the site over a 24 hour period, um, not to see how loud things are, but to see how quiet they get overnight, for instance. Um, we can compare these things to the relevant portions of the Darien and State of Connecticut noise code. Um, Darien's code really just refers back to the state code, which has limits for mainly for fixed sources like the HVAC units. And then in particular for traffic noise, we can look at references for what constitutes a, a perceptible noise impact that the Connecticut DOT publishes um, uh, for noise increases and what might be perceptible. So what we found in summary, each of these aspects uh, is expected to actually reduce noise to the neighboring residential properties versus uh, the current operations at the site. Um, these noise barriers that um, uh, Katie's sections really showed very well, the mansard parapet around the rooftop is, is also going to be a really effective noise barrier. Uh, by raising 10 feet above the roof deck, uh, four feet along the ramp, we're not only interrupting the line of sight to these cars, but the line of sound transmission, which, which kind of follows in turn. Um, we found that the, the slight increase in traffic volume accessing the roof during the AM peak and the increase in elevation of that parking deck, you know, they do tend to increase noise, but the design of the new Mansard barrier, it will overcome it to an even greater degree and actually result in a noise reduction versus what's happening now. And, and you saw from some of the photos and renderings, there's, there's really no impediment to noise transmission from these, these cars in this lot to the closest residences right now, and we're putting an obstacle in the way. Likewise, uh, for the rooftop air conditioners, 
uh, the solid structural wall that's being built to contain those equipment areas, it does the same thing. It, it blocks the line of sight, but it's also blocking a substantial amount of noise. Uh, noise from that equipment will be reduced to less than the, the very quietest background noise we measured overnight, uh, as well as within the, the state noise code limits that might apply. For parked vehicles, uh, from things like car door slamming, um, again, the the future condition will be quieter than the current condition when these things happen on the surface lot, because right now these things uh, transmit noise unimpeded to the residences and the, the 10 foot barrier around the, the rooftop will reduce that noise by getting in the way basically, just, just like for the line of sight. Uh, and then the car wash I think is the most substantial change to the site because the, the, the drier cycle of the car wash which as we just established is happening on a busy day, you know, every five or 10 minutes, it's ex extremely noisy. It's very loud. You have these air blowers that are right at the exit of the car wash lane and projecting a great deal of noise out into the environment. And right now that noise can reach the neighboring properties largely unimpeded. So by relocating the car wash lane, a hundred or plus feet further to the South, the noise is reduced purely through distance, uh, but then, in addition to that, the new building itself is a very effective noise barrier. Uh, and by interrupting, again, this line of sight to the noise source, we achieve quite a bit of, of noise reduction. Um, so in conclusion, uh, for these criteria that we, set, we established, um, there's no adverse noise impact expected if, if you want to move on, Craig, to the next slide from any of these aspects, because each of them is expected to become quieter. If we want to look at that section, actually, that's great. It, it shows that, and we looked at this earlier, um, noise between the, the source and the receiver, we have this 10-foot this tall obstacle. And um, by building a, a pretty substantial structural wall here, we're achieving a, a really significant noise reduction, both for the, uh, the parking deck and, and the four-foot tall parapet wall along the ramp um, contributes as well for cars that are coming and going. So. Each of these sources, uh, and that, that was the uh, sorry the um, the structural wall at the top of the ramp at the landing, which serves not only to shield that opening into the deck, but block the sound from uh, sort of leaking out there as well. So each of these aspects is expected to, to become quieter than the current condition uh, at this surface lot, uh, both from vehicles moving around, parked vehicles, uh, and the HVAC equipment. Um, and certainly all these things will be within the relevant limits, but uh, we expect almost all of it to be quieter than, than the, the quietest overnight background noise that we measured with our equipment. So uh, we really don't expect a noise impact here. It, we really expect a noise benefit to the community with this, with this project. Uh, I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions or I turn it back over to Wilder. The only, the only, I'm sorry about that. The only quick question I have is at the very, very last sentence of uh, actually it's the second last sentence of your report on page 17. Okay. If, new, if new equipment is installed at the new location, lower noise blowers should be should be um, given preference. We're getting new equipment already, right? I don't think that's been determined yet. Um, uh, we haven't decided if we're going to just move the equipment uh, or if we're going to replace it. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. That's fine. So that's the last bullet point on page 17 of his report. Right. And and what time does the dealership open now, Wyler? Like uh, I believe it opens at um, seven, and it uh, goes till eight at night. I believe. Uh, when I pick up my car, they make me get it before six. Maybe I'm special. Well, I, he may be special. <laughs> I, I think they may. I, um, the posted hours were in our narrative, and I don't. Um, the we took those off the website, so I believe it. It may be seven to seven. Uh, Matt, are you here, Matt Cosgrove? It's not a big car? deal, but his recommendation says you know stop washing cars after 10 p.m. The place is shut down. No, oh, we're, 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 we're open. 
we're shut open, down. We're open from 7 a.m. in the morning until 6 in the evening right now. And the car wash will not be running after noontime on Saturday. We're closed on Sunday. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. Thank good. Ten, not 10 o'clock. Okay. So to sum up, um, we are seeking to amend our existing business site plan approval from 2007. And we believe our application meets the requirements of section 1024 for business site plan approval we also need a special permit approval because we're a special permit use in this service business zone we believe we meet all the requirements of section 1005 for that um, based on craig's testimony we meet the requirements of section 850 for land filling and regrading we're not changing grades material you know the, the grades are the slopes are okay and there's no adverse impact on neighboring properties because basically they're all higher than we are um and the the crux of this one is really that you need to find under, under section 907 that no neighboring property will be adversely impacted by our rooftop parking based on the testimony you've got with the traffic and the noise engineers and the design and the architectural impacts and the landscaping and the screening and the changes in lighting, we are confident you have the ability to make that finding and should. And lastly, we're seeking a waiver of the loading zone requirement. Um, as I indicated earlier, we don't have trailer deliveries here. All new cars go to our Stanford site and we have box trucks basically making deliveries here and the turning radiuses are just fine for that so and we haven't had a, a loading zone for over 18 years 20 years so there's no reason to start with one now and it's 10 o'clock thank you all for uh, coming out and giving us this Two and a half hour window to make this presentation to you. Ten oh one, good job. Um, all right, so thank you, Widler. Um, we're going to keep public comment from next time. We're going to keep Michael Galante for next time. We're going to keep Joe Canis for next time. Um, I don't think we have any other peer guys against. Well, we can talk about um, what. Um, what's it? Who's the guy? That's who's the planning zoning guy. No, the, the sewer guy. What's his name? Well, we have Bobby Bush, the fire marshal. They've addressed his comments. Joe Canis has peer reviewed the stormwater. Mike right. Galante, traffic and parking. Darren Ostefine, That's it. I don't think he's going to have any comments. But he's because a, he sent an email. He sent an email, but Joe, he's deferring the stormwater management to Joe Canis. Great. Uh, neighbor comments will be next time. We're going to continue this to Tuesday, March 2nd, 7.30 p.m. You got that, Weiler and um, uh, Mr. Burry? You advised me earlier. Thank you, Steve. Um, I, I do want you to note that the ARB continued their hearing until March 16th. So um, we got 10 minutes tonight and uh, we will finish that up with them. And at that point, they will issue a report. So um, I suspect we will ask you to continue the hearing after the March 2nd deadline so that we can respond to any neighbor comments and uh, any ARB report can be received. Uh, and we will be able to respond to it if necessary. Well, we I, already got one letter from ARB that said they can want to keep working with you. It was signed by, I think, the vice chairman. Yes, they went to ARB earlier tonight, but ARB ran out of time. So they continued it to March 16th. There is a chance they'll have an earlier meeting, but that's unknown at this point. Okay. And ARB is just concerned with the architectural designs. We're in charge of the screening and all that stuff, right? Yeah. yeah noise traffic those things are your bailiwick so and screening and lighting and all that stuff comes to well, us i think they're asserting some they're they're um they're opining on the landscaping and screening that we're doing and we're doing our best to address their concerns and they can if they want colonial light fixtures they can recommend colonial light fixtures if you use modern but that's not the ultimate decision will be with the planning and zoning commission correct no okay. doubt about that okay that's fine. Thank you, Wyler. We'll see you on the Tuesday, March 2nd, 7.30 p.m. We'll continue this public hearing. And again, uh, we'll have the public comment at that time, the peer reviewers commenting, 
and we'll set aside a good portion of the evening on March 2nd for that. Fantastic. All right, great. Thank you, everybody. Um, Steve, it's Jim. I wonder if I can yes, just ask Wilder or maybe Jeremy one question. Um, and that relates to the fact that you're get, swapping. Did you get this, your answer to your noise from about the um, ex exhaust fans? No. No, I made a note to try and uh, I just wanted I really to get that. Uh, and Jim, did we answer your other question? You had another question beyond the exhaust uh, issue. Uh, well, I forgot what it was, so you don't have to worry about it. Location um, of APAC. This, this uh, uh, application is based on swapping between Mini and BMW. Um, is there any need for any kind of permission or whatever with regard to the changes that are going to happen at many? Um, in discussing this with Jeremy, we didn't actually touch on that. If we, uh, if you feel we need to address that, we could um, we could um, think that through, and uh, I'll discuss with Jeremy. I think that's a, a point to uh, discuss. Yeah, I, I wasn't here when we when the the mini was built, and I just wanted to be sure that. There's nothing in the approval for that project that's going to come back and bite us or the applicant in the backside uh, yep. without thinking it through to begin with. Anyway, thank you. Wilder and I will take a look at that question. Thanks, in Jeremy. The okay, then the question going back, um, Wilder, is is uh, Martin Schiff going to be here next week in case we have any noise questions no, for him? Mark second. Mark second. Uh, we can have him here if you have them. Um, uh, we certainly um, uh, would prefer if, if if we've addressed noise, then we're happy to have him stand down. But um, Jim, well, let's ask Jim Rand if he wants to ask that noise question again, which has to do with the roof vents on top of the service oh, building. I well, think it was, where are the HVAC uh, compressors located? Right? Wasn't that it, Jim? That was the no, exhaust. Well, that was covered. Floor. Somebody said they were on the roof, and I saw a picture of them in one of the drawings on the roof. My question related specifically to how do you get the exhaust from the cars that are being tuned up or repaired or whatever out of the building so they don't poison the. the yep, there, yeah. there would, as you described in your question, and then we kind of moved on, there will be an exhaust system that has hoses on hose reels. Um, so that when the car is being uh, tested, it will, the car will be hooked up to an exhaust system and that will be exhausted out uh, through a sidewall discharge. Um, it is, is in all the shops that we build, it, it is pretty standard procedure. And it's currently what we have now. Okay. okay so it's not going to make, the, because of the mansard roof and, and everything else that's going on, that's not going to be a, a, a new additional source of noise no. if any it'll either be what it is today or it'll be less correct correct yes. okay that's, Thank a you. That's, a, that's a question for martin schiff though okay um the the other thing is the right, quality of the air has to be scrubbed as part of what we do there are there's uh, there are osha standards regarding that right mike um that's correct and so we have to comply with OSHA standards, not only for interior air quality for our workers, but also for the air that comes out into the environment that has to be uh, uh, clean. Okay. Okay. Just did um, did Martin Schiff want, just want to comment on on um, on uh, Jim's question relative to noise of those blowers? Well, for uh, what I just discussed, we really focused on the equipment that will be located outdoors on the roof, these compressors, uh, exhaust and fresh air systems, they're kind of ducted to the outside, so there's opportunity there to attenuate them. Uh, they're not actually located outside on the roof, typically. But it's not a new source of noise. It's an existing source of noise that's getting rerouted. It's, uh, yeah, every each one of these garages has an exhaust system right now. Okay. 
Does that answer your question, Jim? Thank you. Perfect. All right, we're good. March Tuesday, March second, seven thirty p.m. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. All right, that ends our Thank public you. meeting for tonight. Um, now, commissioners and the general public, we're going to go into the general meeting. Um, it's now ten ten or ten o five. You know, we said we'd end these meetings at 10 o'clock. Do you guys want to punt this stuff, commissioners, to the next meeting? Yeah. Or do you want to talk about Mick Modder? Uh, if you want to handle that, that should be a three minute thing. All right, I would do Mick Modder and then we can debate. We have time on the on the compass. Uh, our next meeting is the 23rd and there's still plenty of time for that. So we can postpone that to the 23rd. Can we postpone that? Sure. That's fine. So Mick Modder is a quick thing. Yeah. Um, all right, commissioners. I'm just going to amend the agenda. We're going to we're going to push this special permit application for Compass to the next meeting, um, which is the 23rd after vacation, yes. February 23rd. Yes. The only item we have on here is request amendment of special permit um, number 310A is an Apple Make Modern um, 1985 Boston Post Road. Request to modify previous approved hours. We got a letter. From those guys in our packet. Letter, I believe it's from Gwen Lacrano. We got in their summer program. So letter dated February 4th. I'm ready to ask you playing over consider adjustment to the term of class hours as light and uh, adopt in our special permit. Um, Jeremy and I had a conversation about this once already. I didn't think it was a big deal, but I'll let Jeremy explain it to you guys. You know. Right. You might recall when you approved the make modern use, which is in the same building as Mama Carmela's and Papa Joe's, there was a little bit of concern about the lunchtime rush with those two uh, food uses. So the commission said they're uh, part of the conditions of approval, uh, no classes between 12 and two. And as you can see, Ms. Allen is hoping uh, for, to amend that to start a summer class starting in June at 1.30 running from 1.30 to 4.30. So it's a half, it's a 30 minute adjustment. It's a 30 minute adjustment for the eight weeks or nine weeks over the summer. I didn't, I didn't think that was really a big deal, but anybody have any questions? Uh, well, I don't even, I guess my only comment about it is I just happened to have dropped, I dropped my son off at basketball tryout practices um, at the Y. And so I happened to run into make modern pretty serious traffic <laughs> at night. And uh, it's pretty dangerous. I know he's being really annoying. I'm sorry. Yeah, um, what was your dog too? His bedtime is 9.30 and he's annoyed that I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to get us out of here. I know. He's like, all right, let's go. Um, no, but because of the parking situation, <laughs> There was cars on the post road and on the on the road. <laughs> that it like it caused serious traffic, and this was tonight at like I don't know, like ten, like seven o'clock ish. Um, sorry, he's really feisty right now. Stop. Right, um, but this this we're talking about this and, summer from June to no, I know, August. Like, other businesses are closed at this time when that was happening, and and it's just around I think around probably pick up and drop off. But you know, cars are double parking on Roten, and kids are dashing out, and I've seen it myself a couple of times. Right. I um, had to stop and like wait behind cars, and so I think it just has to be managed with the parking lot. I think in the back, with that dumpster situation, they said they were gonna like move and stuff. That doesn't seem to have happened. And, and it doesn't look like kids are using the Roten Presbyterian lot, which I believe they had an agreement with to utilize, which I think would alleviate the issue. Right, Karen, that is correct. One of the conditions of approval was uh, getting the dumpsters a little neater, organized, and screening them. We mentioned that to Gwyn, who mentioned that to Frank, who's the property owner. Frank said that due to COVID and the weather, they are a little behind on screening the dumpsters. Uh, that condition of approval is not changing. Okay. That Fred and I will insist once the weather breaks, that that be done. Just okay, yeah. the the dumpster is going to Well, that, now it's worse. They yeah, it's pretty bad. You have a fence. Right, right. Now there's so, no fence. Right, but it's not taking up space. That's my difference. Right. 
But this request, call. Karen, not to, to change it, is for between June 21st and August 20th. I'm sorry, George, you want to say something? I was just going to say, I think they've improved the uh, the condition of the parking area itself. I think they've added some gravel. They've uh, leveled it off. There's fewer pothole type things. I, I thought that was an improvement. And the it's building itself, of course, to your point, looks beautiful. Like there, yeah. we go it. You know, there's like it just looks really nice, and it's nice to see kids. Jen, any questions? Your mic is on. You're good. All right, I'm looking for a motion. Larry and Jim, you okay? All right, I'm looking for a motion to approve this 30-minute request change. I think it's a, I got, I got three firsts. George, we'll get. Would you give Jennifer? A, is the motion George is the seconder. All in favor? Six to zero. Thank Six you. nothing. Good luck, Erica Allen. You're off to the races. All right. Um, you approve, can we punt approval in minutes? I want to get sure. home. I want to go home. Absolutely. All right. Um, and then Kara's dog's got to go to bed. Yeah. Okay. Luke is done. He's just like enough. All right. Um, I'm going to. I'm going to. Uh, Chairman does not have a report tonight, and then does the subcommittee have a report tonight? No. Where's Where's um Larry Warble and and uh his beard? He's got no report. I'm here. No, any report uh, on subcommittee? I mean, no. The the subcommittee delivered the our letter to the entire committee. I think what and late December. Yeah. Right. Just we a question of, you know, do you want to release that? Do you want to, is it something you want to send to somebody or, you know, those are all, those are all for the, for all of us to decide, not the subcommittee. We'll go over where everything stands in terms of legislation. All right, we'll do that. Jeremy's going to go over it. The, le the, the legislative items changed and some of the things changed since we last did it. But I mean, uh, the beauty of the subcommittee is that we studied all this stuff and now it's changed again. Um, but the comps are there. So, we can, Jeremy can talk about that next time. We'll bring it to the 23rd. Great, thank you. Um, is that good by you guys? The subcommittee people? Yep, all right, good. Um, other business, two thirds vote. Uh, we're not taking a vote, so there's no other business. Mm -hmm. um, next meeting is February 23rd, which is after break, and then March 2nd. And March 2nd is gonna be BMW, and February 23rd is, is what? Uh, a number of minor public hearing items and a general meeting. We're not, there's no 7-Eleven yet. That's not until March not something. until March, so we can't. Okay. okay. With that said, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. Jim Rand, seconded by the dog. I mean, Kara's dog. I mean, Kara. That's <laughs> a favor. All right, folks, we'll see you next time. Good luck, Erica. Good night. Thank you. Meeting is ended. Thank you, Fred.